Okay, we're going to come back to order. And the next bill on the agenda is House File 3. Chair Liebling, feel free to proceed. All right. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. We're going to, um, I would like to move House File 3 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Finance Omnibus Bill. And um, I think I have some testifiers here. In fact, I think I have. You want to uh, do the amendments, Chair Lee? Okay. I don't think I have the amendment, Madam Chair. We have an 812 amendment. Let's see, I think I need a copy of that. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. I think I got it. Did you give all them? Yeah. Do you want to move the A12 amendment? Chair yes, Kimberly? Madam Chair, I would like to move the A12 amendment to put the bill in the form in which I would like to discuss it. And um, right, and um, maybe I could just explain what that is as I'm doing it. So that deletes a section that Representative Zerwas pointed out when we had a hearing in the um, in the GovOps committee, and this was uh, data having to do with the all-payer claims data uh, um, base that would send the bill to civil law. We don't really need this at this time, and so we're just deleting the language as per his suggestion. Okay, so. members, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Okay, amendment is adopted. All right, and then and the next um, amendment is the A15 amendment. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A15 amendment, and um, maybe it would be the best, Madam Chair, if we um, let me just look at this for a second. Okay, it would be best if we adopt. The A15, just to get the bill in order, and then I will explain that along with the rest of the okay. bill. Okay, members, all in favor of adopting the A15 amendment to House File 3, say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, amendments adopted. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. So <laughs> this is House File 3 is um, much of the governor's one care proposal. Thank you. And um, it contains several different parts. So um, one of the, um, it, it's a, the proposal, the entire proposal is one that phases in over four years. And this mostly has to do with the pieces that phase in actually in, in the third and fourth year of the phase in. So it, in, it um, involves a couple of benefit packages, one for dental services, one for pharmacy. And then in year four, it kicks in with um, putting a new um, insurance option on Minsure that would be a platinum plan that would um, have, a, as members will know, a platinum plan has a much better actuarial value. It would mean that People who purchase that plan would have access to much lower out-of-pocket costs. There are other pieces to this as well that are not in this bill that we're going to be hearing today, and that has to do with um, assistance for uh, consumers with the affordability of these products and all the products. So I'm not going to talk about that right now. But in terms of... Um, what the governor is doing, I am most excited about the two benefit packages. As many of you know, dental care in our state has been a ferment for our, our um, Minnesotans on public programs, dental care has been a real challenge. And one of the big challenges for us is that we have, we're running our dental care program through, um, through our PMAP, our prepaid medical assistance program, and through fee for service. And so dental providers are often having to deal with multiple insurance, if you will, for people who are essentially all on public programs. So this is creating kind of a complicated mess for them. Not only that, but um, it makes it very difficult for us as legislators to understand what we're paying. 
and where the payments are going. So I think members of this committee have um, understood for a long time that one of the issues with managed care, the way we do it in our public programs, is that the rates that they pay for various services are proprietary. So as legislators, we're often struggling with trying to raise rates to actually make sure that our, our constituents who use these programs can get the services for which we believe we're paying, and we have a real challenge doing that. So that is another benefit of going to this um, single benefit for all of our public patients. So that is in this bill. Also, the um, pharmacy benefit is uh, something that I think is really exciting. And this is using the state's buying power to bring down pharmaceutical costs. So we've heard a lot of bills in this committee, and we're gonna hear even more, I think, that try to get at the issue of healthcare costs as it relates to the cost of pharmaceuticals. We've heard a lot about how the prices are just going up and up. This is an enormous part of our healthcare increases in healthcare costs. And particularly when patients don't get the medications they need because of cost, it also increases healthcare costs on the back end. We've heard quite a bit about this. So what this is doing is creating a benefit package where we would no longer run our pharmaceutical program through the HMOs that we are, are in PMAP. This pulls the program out, and by doing so, it, it cuts out the, the uh, PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers that are running the programs now under PMAP. So this is gonna help us save money overall, and it's going to, um, both because we're, we're not losing the cut that the PBMs are taking right now, and because we have more people in one pool, the state will be able to leverage that more buying power to get lower prices. So um, I'm excited about this. Now, one of the amendments that I adopted is um, this, this benefit is eventually, um, there, there had been discussion about having this not be only available for public program patients, but this is something that should benefit all Minnesotans because every single Minnesotan, no matter where they're getting their insurance, if they need certain pharmaceuticals, they are victims of the same price increases. Even if your employer is paying part of the cost, um, we've seen that more and more cost has been shifted to employees. And even if the employer is kind enough to pay it, it's coming out of the wages of those employees. So, this is a general problem across the state, and this is one way that can get at it. So the um, amendment, the A15 that we put on the bill, simply has the Commissioner of Human Services develop a plan for how this um, benefit can include others who are not on the public program. So this is, you know, it's, it was, um, we tried to kind of figure it out, uh, but we ran out of time to do that. And so this is something that has to be thought through carefully how this would work. And so this is what the amendment does. So um, with that, I think. Um, would you like to call up testifiers? I can call up testifiers. Yeah. We, we do have one question, could. but I think I'm going to have members wait until the testifiers testify. Uh, okay, that would be so great. So Marie Zimmerman, here. Assistant Commissioner of Healthcare and State Medicaid Director is on deck. And then um, Rick Varco, are, are you ready yeah. to testify? Yeah, if Marie Zimmerman could come. She would be great. Hi. And I hope she'll correct anything I said wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens, Chair Liebling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you never say anything wrong, right? <laughs> uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Marie Zimmerman, I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Healthcare at the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Uh, I will keep my um, comment short here because Representative Liebling, Chair Liebling did uh, a wonderful job giving an overview, so I'll probably be uh, very brief and to leave time for um, other testifiers. Uh, so the, as Representative Liebling mentioned, the One Care package is really part of a larger sort of comprehensive package um, put forward by the governor and the lieutenant governor um, really to help achieve uh, comprehensive coverage when people need it and for people to see their providers in their own community and to address the rising costs of prescription drugs. 
Uh, it is part of, as um, Representative Liebling said, sort of a, a phased in approach. There's going to be other things that are talked about uh, in this committee today that are part of the individual market component. So the state subsidy, the tax credit that are happening in year 2020 and 2021. And the one care package really starts in uh, 2022 with the two uh, pharmacy and dental benefits that uh, Chair Liebling described. And then also the uh, one care uh, buy-in product. Uh, starts in 2023. So that's sort of the overview. So the one care package is really three components. It's really aimed at reducing the price of prescription drugs, um, increasing access uh, for uh, to dental care, and creating that comprehensive uh, buy-in options for uh, consumers in the individual market. So for the one care prescription drugs, we're really trying to leverage the state's purchasing power that we have um, and how we run the program now for our Medicaid fee-for-service program. So we're really sort of creating a common um, a formulary across and the same purchasing strategy across Medicaid, Minnesota Care, and the buy-in um, option, and really leveraging sort of the transparent processes that we have now for that program. In fact, our drug formulary committee just met last night and, and finalized our, our uniform PDL. Um, so we have a couple of different oversight bodies. Oh, I'm already at 30 seconds. Um, and uh, really we're, what we're seeing is that in our DHS uh, Medicaid fee-for-service program that we have uh, managed that program where the trends that we're seeing um, in fee-for-service are much lower than what we've seen in our managed care plan. Uh, for the dental access, I'll just say briefly, we have 60% of our kids on Medicaid not having a dental visit. So that's 375,000 kids that are on public programs. We also have people, 30,000 people driving over 70 miles to try and see a dental provider. So we're really trying to provide uh, that access for people in their own communities. Um, and then the last component is the the one care buy-in um, option, which is, as Representative Liebling mentioned, the 90% actuarial value, which just means that your premium is paying for 90% of the cost, really trying to address those high out-of-pocket costs, high deductible plans, meant for people that need to use their health care, trying to create a continuity between Medicaid, Minnesota Care, and this buy-in option with having the same provider networks. Um, and with that, respecting the time, I will, I will close and be available for any questions. Thank you. And Madam Chair. Okay. And Chair Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just would like to um, tell, please come sit. I just would like to um, mention something that I forgot that may be important to some of the people in the room. And that is, there's been a big issue about um, the way this program was designed with regard to the rates for dental care. And I have uh, told many that I am concerned about the way the rate program is set forth in this bill. And I have been working with many to try to figure out how to rewrite that. Um, but because of the short deadlines that we're on, I was not able to do that. So I'm not adjusting the rates in the bill. But I do want everybody to know that it is my intention to preserve payments for critical access dental. The reason I don't feel it's very urgent today is because the dental benefit, as you've heard, does not actually go into effect mm -hmm. until the third year. So there isn't a real urgency about fixing that, but I, I don't want people to kind of freak out that, because I know many people are concerned about the way the rates are being redone in this bill, and I do not consider that to be a final, this is not the final question, even though it's not being amended today. Okay, thank th you. thanks for that clarification. Mr. Varco. Chair Schultz, members of the committee, Rick Varco, political director, SEIU Healthcare Minnesota, testifying support of House File 3 on behalf of our union. At the time the ACA passed, we strongly supported a public option to make sure everyone had an affordable choice, but we were told that private insurance could do the job. Clearly they have failed. I'm sure all of you have heard that premiums are too high and that even when premiums are affordable, high copays and high deductibles strip insurance of almost any value. For example, when the son of our member James Holt Jr. tried to find a plan, the best he could find had a $7,600 deductible. Since his insulin and supplies cost almost $1,300 a month, he decided to go without insurance until he could find a job with insurance. Within a month, he had died while rationing his insulin. House File 3, specifically the One Care Platinum Level Option and the new prescription drug provisions, would give people like Alec an affordable option with far level lower levels, lower levels of cost sharing. 
Even with strong regulation and heavy subsidies, individual consumers still don't have the power to force insurance companies to offer quality products. One care through the platinum option and the further contingent gold silver options aggregates the power of, of Medica Medicaid and Minnesota care to get them a better deal. In fact, the main argument against one care seems to be that it will work too well and that everyone will choose it and private insurance won't be able to compete. But if at the end of the day, people get better insurance, why would we let that stop us? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Varco. Next um, up is Steve Port. Is he here? And then after Steve Bentley Graves. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Steve. I am a husband and a father, and I'm here to testify on behalf of, behalf of House File 3, the One Care proposal. I've been self-employed since 2001. Uh, before the ACA, getting insurance as a single person was a nightmare. The application was dozens of pages long, and if you left anything out, it was grounds for canceling your coverage. Of course, if you included everything, they could use that information to deny having coverage uh, due to a pre-existing condition. In 2009, my wife, Lindsay, and I got married. Before that, I was uninsured and uh, simply couldn't, uh, I didn't, I just didn't get sick. I, <laughs> that's what I tried to do. Um, but we wanted to have kids and with the family uh, to be accountable for, I finally powered through all the red tape. It got easier after the ACA was passed. All we had to do was submit a short questionnaire and click go. I almost cried. Like, I'm not exaggerating. I had an actual tear come down my face when I hit that button and it said, all right, you're good. Um, we are currently on UCARE, uh, which we've had every year since the exchange is open. We went with a silver plan, which was the best overall value for us. Our current plan has a $6,000 deductible for the family. We pay $1,077 a month in premiums. Uh, that's a family of four. It doesn't cover everything we need. I've been dealing with a long-term injury, but was referred to a doctor who was out of network by my in-network doctor. The insurance won't cover us uh, as in-network, and I've had to file an appeal because he's the only doctor in the state capable of doing what the referral from the doctor says I require. If they deny my appeal, that'll be an additional $3,500 I have to pay out of pocket. Last year, my wife needed medication. The doctor put it on, her, on a, the doctor from, again, our in-care, uh, uh, in-network care, said the doctor uh, put her on her specific and very expensive prescription. Our insurance company refused to cover it. It cost us $400 a month for six months to, to cover the thing that their doctor prescribed to us. All of that was out of pocket. Um, it doesn't even, doesn't even account towards the deductible. It's just not a thing that they even consider. Last year, I'm sorry, our, our state can do better than making hardworking families pay over $1,000 for health insurance and still get the runaround with the insurance companies. I ask that you put Minnesota families first, vote yes on HF 13, and work towards a health care plan that is simple, affordable, and works for all of us. Finally, this year, we renewed directly with UCARE instead of going through the exchange. I understand that the legislature is working to issue a credit to plans purchased through the exchange. As of now, my family wouldn't benefit from that. I ask this body expand the access to the credit to include ACA qualified plans obtained by self-insured people no matter where they purchase their health care. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Port. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Graves, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Bentley Graves with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the, the, the One Care proposal that's been brought forward by, uh, by Governor Walls grows out, as, as, you can, as you've heard, grows out of a concern about rising health care costs. And that's uh, a concern that our members, uh, employers all around the state, have had for a very long time. Um, but it's, it's the, our concerns with this proposal uh, are rooted in those same concerns about rising health care costs for employers. Already, those with, th those with commercial insurance pay more uh, for the care they receive from doctors and hospitals and other providers in order, in many cases, to make up for the low uh, reimbursements paid uh, by public programs. And, and this proposal being tied uh, largely to Medicare rates, uh, which are much lower than commercial rates. And so our concern with this proposal moving forward is that it will draw more people onto a program that pays providers less than commercial insurance does uh, and will otherwise put upper pressure on those commercial insurance costs uh, raising costs for employers and their employees. Um, but I, uh, as I said, I understand the, uh, the concerns about rising health care costs. Those are concerns that our members have had for a long time. Um, but our concern more broadly is with the direction that this would uh, uh, 
push those rates that employers and employees pay. But I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Maureen O'Connell. You're not Maureen O'Connell, but welcome to the committee. No. State your Thank name you. and affiliation, please. My name is Sabrina Moritz, and I'm speaking on behalf of Maureen O'Connell and also on behalf of Take Action Minnesota. I'm here today to so express our support for um, HF3 and the A14 amendment that we anticipate. Um, Raman Ali um, is a leader of Take Action Minnesota. He's a proud father and husband. Um, he has three children. He lives in Burnsville and works as a bus driver. Like many Minnesotans, health care is the issue that keeps Raman and his wife, Deco, up at night. Two of his sons are autistic. Deco cares for them full time. She also has a painful and chronic autoimmune disease that, disease that causes arthritis in her spine. Every month she goes to the doctor to get Remicade, a prescription drug that costs $1,200 a month. Raman makes $21 an hour. Right now, Raman and his wife are uninsured. Last year, they qualified for Minnesota care. They got the care they needed at a cost they could afford. But right now, they have no good options. Insuring both of them through Raman's employer would cost $700 per month with high deductibles. DECA would be eligible for Minnesota care, um, except that she has access to employer coverage through her husband. But what good is health insurance if you can't afford it? Fixing the Minnesota Care family glitch would ensure DECO could get simple, affordable, quality coverage. This peace of mind would help the whole family. Raman said that with Minnesota Care, DECO could sleep at night knowing she will be able to get the treatment she needs to prevent new bone growth from fusing her vertebrae together. Our government is responsible for making health care work for everyone. And Raman wanted me to say to the committee and Adam Chair, thank you and God bless you. We urge you to vote yes on HF3. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Thank you. Mary Cotis. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Mary Cotis. Um, my story doesn't contain any rare disease or extraordinary circumstances. I'm a nurse, I live right here in St. Paul, and I'm here today to support House File 3 and the One Care proposal because I'm completely 100% average. Um, in 2017 and 18, I worked for a small private practice that didn't offer their own contracted group insurance. Um, I had to purchase health care um, by myself, um, so I went through a broker, um, one that was really popular called Gravy, and I've been with them since 2017. The choices that I were presented were very limited. Many of the plans um, would have cost me up to a third of my paycheck, and that's just in premiums. Um, so I chose an affordable plan that I could find. I'm healthy, didn't have any pre-existing conditions, so I chose a Silver Peak Plus plan. Um, it was manageable at first. Um, I used the coverage for preventative care, mental health, and the few times a year that I would have to see a physician on an acute basis. Um, but in 2018, I needed a hysterectomy. The second most common surgical procedure for women in the U.S., and over 600,000 of, 600, of them are performed every year. Um, have, having a hysterectomy is hard enough. There's the emotional and physical preparation that you go through, and a standard recovery can be up to eight weeks. Um, so the last thing you have to want to worry about is whether or not you can afford such a commonplace procedure. But my recovery was overshadowed as bills started showing up back to back even before I had gone back to work. Um, so despite paying $300 a month in premiums, a $3,000 deductible and a $7,500 out of pocket max, including the prescriptions um, that the insurance didn't pay, my total health care um, cost out of pocket was $12,500 in 2018. Um, that was half of my taxable income for 2018. Um, I'm a nurse. I help people navigate both small and big health issues every day, um, making sure people get the care they deserve. Um, and we know our system is failing when our health care workers can't afford the care that they're providing. Mm. Um, so I was solidly middle class, but because of the broken health care system, I now live in extreme poverty. 
Um, and this happened in a very short amount of time. So now I have a total of 27 creditors demanding payments that I'm struggling to pay. And this is what the current system is doing to average Minnesotans like me. Um, I value my security. I want health care that I can depend on, that I know won't make me go broke for having a health care issue, um, and for getting a procedure that women across Minnesota are getting every day. So um, our government needs to be responsible for making sure that our health care system works for all of us. So I really urge you guys to please vote yes for House File 3 and One Care. Thank you, Ms. Cotis. Is there anyone else that would like to testify on House File 3 in the audience? Okay, we have questions from members. So, represent or Chair Liebling, did you want to respond? Well, Madam Chair, I do have the other amendment that we're, we have. We're going to move. wait on that when, just for whenever one minute. Ready. So, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and uh, to uh, Chair Liebling, thanks for uh, bringing this forward to have the discussion on uh, this public option. Um, like the previous testifier, um, I had similar issues with health care in uh, paying, you know, $24,000, $26,000 a year in premiums for my family of four with a $13,300 deductible. And so many people have these high deductibles because they can, that's the only premiums they can afford on the bronze plan to get into insurance, but very, very few people actually have the cash set aside to actually pay for their deductible. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, and I only have one insurance company available in my area. And so I encourage more competition. And this public option would be more competition. My concern, uh, and as expressed earlier, is if the reimbursement rates are so low that doctors and clinics are shuttering in our area, it's, uh, you know, it's not going to be good for rural Minnesota. But my question for, for uh, Representative Liebling are, um, I guess my, my concerns are on this phased-in approach. In my opinion, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act uh, was uh, failed, had a failed phased in approach because it delivered all of the good stuff first and then all of, and then all of the penalties and the higher costs were, came in later after the plan was implemented. And by, by having this platinum plan available first, uh, you're gonna, this, this, this public option will attract the people with the highest medical costs first. So basically people that, that have chronic illness would, would purchase this plan because it has the lowest deductible because they have higher costs every year and it would shift those people out of the private market and private insurance companies would probably be supportive of that, this, this phased in approach. But it, it's gonna create this pool of people with the highest medical costs in, the, in this one care option and it's, it's, going to, it's, it's not gonna be sustainable. It's gonna demand dollar, public dollars come in to, to offset this. And so what, what windows are open for, uh, for public money to subsidize this plan which is my fear. I don't want all this public money going into this plan. It would be nice if it could be self-supportive, but um, are there conduits for, for public money to come into this one care plan to, to offset the costs? Or is the only choice going to be to lower reimbursement rates to the providers? Because everything we're talking about here is insurance pools. We're not really talking about how to treat, treat people better uh, as far as better care. We're just shifting the dollars around to these insurance pools. So what what conduits are, would be available for public money to come flooding in to support this, this uh, one care plan? Chair Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Munson. Uh, that opens a huge, uh, there's a lot of actually a lot of questions in there. Um, let me first say that um, in our country, there's, there are very few people who have health care of any kind with no subsidy. We are subsidizing health care, either through our tax system to employers and employees or through public programs. Almost everybody is getting a subsidy. The only people right now who are not getting any kind of subsidy are the people in the individual market. And that in Minnesota is about 155,000 people. And I think it's about half of those now are getting are actually now getting a subsidy under the Affordable Care Act to help them pay their premiums. So when you worry about not subsidizing health care, I would say that the problem with subsidizing health care is that what we're subsidizing is a very fractured and inefficient system. And um, 
So uh, this is a little bit off the topic of one care, which I'll address specifically, but just kind of to address your question generally, I, I'm, you know, we have to kind of recognize that healthcare in this country is so expensive that very few people can afford it without some help. And what we've done is carve out different ways that different people get subsidized and we've left behind this one small group of people. And we see the results of that and what that really means. As for your family, when you have to pay the full freight yourself and you don't even get a tax deduction. So what the governor's plan is doing, and it, you know, it's trying to help the people in that small niche. So there are different aspects to this plan, right? Some of this is part of the, some of it relates to our public programs, trying to make those better and less costly. But some of it relates to the, the individual market, these 155,000 people. For those people, we're gonna hear other bills today that deal with how this helps support those people. So if you don't like public money going into healthcare, uh, I think that the horse has already left the barn because there is a lot of public money going into health care. And the question is, are we going to leave some people behind? I, I don't know how else to put it. I would, you know, you everyone knows, this is not my preferred method of doing that. Yeah, I think it's very inefficient. I think that, uh, you know, we have a system that is so inefficient that the cost of health care, a lot of our cost, almost a third of what we pay is in fact not going to health care. It's going to pay all administrative costs. And, you know, we do an awful lot. We spend a lot of money shuffling money instead of getting care for people who need care. And we've heard bills in this committee that really illustrate that, how inefficient our system is. So let me then move to your kind of the other part of your question, more focusing on the bill before us. So in the One Care program, the governor is, is putting out a program, a platinum plan, which is a niche that is not currently filled because there are no platinum plans on the market right now. And there are going to be under this plan, if the whole thing is enacted, there are a couple ways that people will receive public support to help buy those plans and all the plans on the individual market. So one is a 20% a premium subsidy that we talked about when we discussed reinsurance and the alternative to reinsurance. So that's part of the one care plan is that 20% subsidy. You referred to it on the floor. You know, somebody's paying 20% of your dinner and your dinner's cheaper. I thought that was a great analogy. So that's in, that will be in the plan. There's also extending the premium tax credit, which right now the federal government pays for up to 400% of the federal poverty level if you buy through Mincher you get a, a subsidy that you um, that takes makes your premium more affordable, and um, but there's a cliff at 400% of poverty, and what this plan will do, not the bill before you, but one that's coming, will extend that using state dollars um, up to higher income levels to get rid of the cliff and make sure that nobody has to pay more than 9.8, I think it is 9.8% of your income. So yeah, it uses, it uses dollars, taxpayer dollars, to subsidize people so they can have insurance. Is this the most efficient way to do that? I would say no. Is this better than anything else that we've got right now? I think so. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, I guess there's a provision in here that says the commissioner is prohibited from expending state dollars beyond what's specifically appropriated in law um, for transferring money in the accounts. But it doesn't say that the commissioner can't just pay down the insurance premiums of, from, I mean, beyond the 20% uh, option that you're discussing. And I, I think that having private insurance as well as a public option could be healthy in certain areas. I just I fear that a public a public option that that is specifically set up to attract people who have the highest medical costs uh, would in the short term benefit private insurance companies, but in the long term be their demise. And so uh, that's just it's it's frustrating. I just I hate to see this marketplace play out where we end up with only one option in the end, and it's a public option. And then when lawmakers get to decide who gets paid and how much people get paid. That's where the, the scary part of government and the outside influence of money in politics just kind of disgusts me. So I, I, I love having a private insurance market out there competing 
uh, with any public option that would be out there. And so I'm, I'm fearful that we're not going to be implementing this fully at, at the beginning to see if it can you know, support itself as opposed to kind of trickling this in and, and setting out mm. the uh, phased in approach. Madam Chair. Chair Lee Blink. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Munson, I think you might misunderstand how this is going to work. It's not that the plan starts and then kind of dribbles into place over the time. They need the time to set up the plan and get it to start. And it only starts in 2023. So it's not like doled out in some way where the thing isn't fully operational for some time. It just doesn't start until later. I mean, Ms. Zimmerman could probably come down and explain that in more detail. The, to the issue about high medical costs, I don't know, you're making an assumption that people who would want to have a plan with lower out-of-pocket costs are sicker than p other people. And I would argue that the sickest people are going to want the coverage on the high end, not the lower out-of-pocket part of it. So I, I don't know that that assumption that this is going to attract the sickest people is really accurate. I mean, and I think that that's part of uh, what they're going to be figuring out as the thing goes along. But I have to say, this is a plan, as I understand the governor's intention with this plan, this plan is intended to preserve the individual market for insurance. Were I designing the plan, I wouldn't preserve the individual market because I don't think the individual market works. I think it's highly inefficient and doesn't deserve to live. But I would not give it health care or an infusion. However, that's not what the governor has decided to do. And the best should not be the enemy of the good. So this is something that will help people. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, it is, I understand this as an attempt to preserve the individual market. Now, I've heard others uh, say that this is going to destroy the individual market. And as I said in another committee when we discussed this bill, if some of you think it's going to destroy the market, and I don't think it does destroy the market because I'd kind of like to destroy the market and put something else in place, maybe this is a good moderate position. Sure. Um, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just want to clarify, so uh, for healthy people who don't have expensive uh, medical needs, we're attracted to the bronze plans, which have a very high deductible and lower premiums, or at least it's supposed to work that way. Um, but the, the platinum plans have higher premiums and lower, lower deductibles, and those are the types of plans, if I had $20,000 in recurring medical expenses every year, I would go with the, pre, the platinum plan. And then uh, that's, that's why I think if you start with a platinum plan only, you attract uh, people with higher medical needs. And, and if you were to have, if, we were to, if, the, if the public option were to have bronze and silver and everything else, then you would also attract healthier people into that pool. So that's why, that's why I expressed my concern over only offering platinum plans. Well, Madam Chair, I don't know how long we want to go on with this, but it would be something that you could discuss with Ms. Zimmerman. She would be more able to really address that than I would. And I'm happy to t talk offline with you, Representative Munson, about segmenting the insurance markets. Okay, Representative Cantrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Liebling. I wanted to thank you for the work that you've done on this bill. Um, and I especially wanted to um, highlight uh, the, the, the um, pharmaceutical program that's enshrined in here. Um, I know that you and I are very much aligned in our views on how we uh, really believe that we can best ensure that all Minnesotans can get the health care they need, can get affordable pharmaceuticals in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and I think that this bill makes great inroads in achieving that. Uh, under the, the fee-for-service programs in the state of Minnesota, fee-for-service benefits, uh, costs have remained relatively stagnant, whereas for the managed care benefits, they've risen, or they rose between 2015 to 2017, 21.5%, largely because of the pharmacy costs. So I don't think that through your bill, uh, Chair Liebling, you are establishing some type of state-level PBM I think you are establishing a solution to the PBMs and a solution to the middlemen involved in our, in our health care that ultimately are, are behind the rise in costs. Because instead of pocketing the supplemental rebates for these pharmaceuticals, now the state can pass on those savings to patients. And, and under this plan, these are the folks who need it the most in our state. They are some of the most vulnerable people in our state, Chair Liebling. And I wanted to thank you so much for all the work that you've done on this. Um, and I'm excited to, to see how we, can, how we can make this grow and make sure that every single Minnesotan is able to get the health care they need. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Cantrell. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Yeah, Representative Liebling, I do appreciate your honesty about destroying the private market. <laughs> I'm glad you, I like to be direct, and I know you do too. Um, yeah, I've got a few comments about uh, Mr. Graves' testimony from the chamber, and then I do have a question uh, to ask. But just a couple things about Mr. Graves. He talked about the low reimbursement. I think people need to understand, while well, first I want to admit health care is a crisis, and it's gotten, I've sold health insurance since 1978, and it's been a problem for a long time. Unfortunately, Obamacare and government intervention has made it worse, not better, and that's why we're sitting in the mess we are. But uh, that's just a general statement. The, uh, the other thing I uh, want to bring out and expand a little bit on on Mr. Graves' testimony is the low reimbursement of government health plans. Uh, these are the averages paid in Minnesota for an MRI knee x-ray, okay? Uh, Medicaid, which Minnesota Care reimburses at, would pay a, doc would pay a doctor or hospital $172. <laughs> for the MRI on average in the state. Uh, Medicare will pay $272. Private insurance will pay $851. <laughs> Doctors and hospitals lose money on government <clears throat> reimbursement rates. And for 50 years, they've been cost shifting their losses on government health insurance over to the private market, which is why your premiums have gone up so much. And then. Obamacare made it worse. So the problem is, in 2016, the Minnesota Hospital Association issued a report that 39%, almost 40% of Minnesota hospitals are losing money. And there's a, a, another number that are just barely making any money, many of them in the rural area. So the problem is you expand low reimbursement rates of government health care in this state you're gonna close many of the healthcare facilities, especially in rural area, and, or cripple them in terms of the healthcare services they provide. Um, other negative effects of government healthcare, of expanding it since Obamacare, uh, the Minneapolis Tribune just issued a, uh, reports, and you can check this out yourself, 53% of the doctors in our state uh, answered a survey that they're burnt out on the cur current system, okay? So that's over half the doctors, and we're having a shortage of doctors, especially in the rural areas as we go forward. In addition to that, national reports show that rural hospitals are closing since Obamacare has been passed at the fastest rate in 30 years, okay? So we're closing hospitals and, and medical access across the country and state because of the low reimbursement of government health care. Finally, um, and then I'll ask my question. Uh, we got HF 1580, which we already heard at, in the committee today. And it basically said because of low medical, uh, medical assistance or Medicaid reimbursement, many of our durab durable medical equipment providers are going to close or are closing. So the people providing prosthetics, orthotics, and other medical equipment, they're going out of business because of the low reimbursement on Medicaid. So we had a can you bill. Get to your question, Representative yep. Grunhey, and, and you can, you know, you can talk about this on the floor. I know. The... I need to educate some of these people too. <laughs> we just passed this bill, and in, uh, we want to add another 2.7 million in reimbursement to the Medicaid rates, and another 6.2 million in the following biennium. So we're bailing out the government low reimbursement of government health plans. The unfortunate thing is. Representative Liebling and this Minnesota One Care is only going to make this situation worse, not better. Uh, and here comes the question, um, okay. if I can remember it. No. <laughs> 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 um, my question for uh, Chair Liebling is, how will your plan that you have with low reimbursement rates currently at Medicaid level, okay, help the situation of hospitals that are losing money doctor burnout, and also statistics that show that hospitals are closing at the fastest rate in 30 years with no end in sight in, in our country. Well, she thinks of the answer, and she already knows it. That, was a, that, was, that question was way too easy for Charlie Blaine. Um, <laughs> well, let's Representative Grunhagen, what, do you know what the costs of an MR, MRI are at a hospital? Do you know that Medicaid, Medicare are, are paying less than the cost? 
I mean, that's a rhetorical question, but I, yeah. I mean, at some point, the marginal cost of an MRI is very low once you, once yeah. you do so many screenings. Chairman so. Schultz, if you read my book, you'll find that out. I did read your book. <laughs> I did read your book, Representative okay. Grunhagen, on the floor, I think my first or second year here, but Chair Liebling. Well, Madam Chair and Representative Grunhagen, I mean, we, I don't, well, don't want to prolong this too much, but I would just say that um, we heard a bill earlier today, the swing bed bill, which was about uh, where you were kind of on the side of not letting the critical access hospitals uh, have the patients and make the money because it would take some money away from nursing homes, I guess. And now you're kind of on the other side of that. So I don't know, there's a little, sometimes kind of hard to figure out which way you're going with this. But I would say that this bill really doesn't relate to um, physician burnout except that I think that many physicians would tell you that the reason that they feel burned out is because of all the paperwork and dealing with the insurance companies, not from dealing with the patients. They spend a lot of their time dealing with paperwork. And I'm married to a physician. I, I know that to be true. And he is within a big system. So he doesn't even do as much as some. But um, this is, you know, our, our system forces, this is part of the waste in our system, that people who are there who want to give care to patients can't because they're, they are, have all these, uh, they're dealing with multiple insurance companies. And that is one of the things in this bill. We have the dental benefit, which would help to alleviate that, at least for dental care. So that that is an uh, answer to that. As far as the um, reimbursements, um, you know, it's uh, part of the problem right now is that we don't know what the HMOs reimburse, what rates they use, what they pay, and we don't have any control over it. And we try to raise, raise those rates and we don't even sometimes see where that money goes. So, and finally, I would just say that you can't both worry about the cost of health care and complain that government pays too little. I mean, you know, when you say, oh, they charge $800 for a, I forget what procedure you were talking about there. You know, the question, I think Representative Schultz is kind of alluding to it. The question isn't what are they charging? The question is what does it really cost? And the problem is we don't have a very good handle on what does it really cost. So, I, and I could bring up uh, Ms. Zimmerman to answer some of this, but I think probably we should move on, Madam Chair. Yeah, I think we should move on too, but. Um, Madam Chair, I should. Uh, Follow up. Representative Grunhagen, one right. more question. Okay. Please, a question, please. Uh, I just make a statement rather than use a question, okay? As far as the nursing home thing that you brought up, I wouldn't have been had as much caution about it if the governor's plan wasn't to cut $200 million from the nursing home reimbursement in this state. So they're already going to see under the governor's plan a $200 million cut, which many rural nursing homes cannot sustain. They'll be closing or providing fewer ser medical services out there to some of our most critical needed one. Second thing, Obamacare, as far as complexity and paperwork, Obamacare moved the CPT billing codes from 18,000 uh, in the uh, healthcare billing system to 140,000 different CPT codes. You talk about complexity and, and uh, creating a paperwork overburden, that's what abomination care, Obamacare did. And finally, I will end with a comment from the CEO of Mail that he made about a year ago and quoted in the Minneapolis Tribune. He said that, uh, and was quoted, that uh, the Mail was going to favor private insurance patients over government insurance patients. And the reason, now, now why would he say that? Because of the losses on government reimbursement, okay? And, and they actually make money on private insurance. So I would strongly urge that we don't expand government health care. Tom Gillespie says if we don't get government health care costs under control in this state, there will be no additional money in the future for higher ed, K-12, or roads or bridges. So if you don't want any additional money for those three areas, support this plan. Thank you, Otherwise, reform Thank the you, private health care. Thank you, one point, though, especially rural hospitals, they'd rather have a payment, Medicaid payment or Medicare payment, than have uncompensated care. So expanding coverage to more people in Minnesota really does benefit those hospitals in greater Minnesota. Uh, Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to highlight 
financial aspects of the proposal that haven't been touched on yet. Uh, so, uh, Chair Liebling, first of all, I see this as a state is creating it, its own insurance company. And I'm curious then if the state is managing the risk or is the plan that DHS will hire a TPA to administer it so that the TPA will manage the risk? Chair Liebling. Well, my understanding, I don't know if Marie Zimmerman wants to come back and, and address this, but my understanding is that um, they will hire a third party administrator, but not to manage risk just to manage the nuts and bolts of claims and stuff like that. You know, I know people sometimes say, well, the state isn't in the business of managing risk, but actually that's not true. The state manages a lot of risk. We have over a million Minnesotans on public programs, and we are managing the risk of that. And we are managing the risk in our, in our Minnesota care as well as our Medicaid population. So the state manages risk all the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, I can't, I guess whether the state is starting an insurance company is kind of a matter of your definitions, I guess. But, um, you know, in terms of starting to manage risk that we don't already manage, we do. And um, so I'll just, I'll just leave it at that unless Ms. Zimmerman Rep. wants to make Haley. an additional comment. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to that regard then, um, the, minute, the one care plan is proposing that people will buy platinum plans. Um, to my experience, there's low participation in platinum plans right now because they are the most expensive. So I'm curious of that logic. And also, if the state is going to be managing this risk, we don't have any actuarial data that I've seen that tells us what the platinum plans will cost. And that's a red flag. So you, you've stated we're going to be managing the risk, and yet we don't have any numbers in order to approve this plan, which inherently insurance is very, very high risk. So connect those dots for me, and if you can give any um, anticipation of what platinum plans will cost. Chair Liebling. So, uh, the, you know, the, it is important to realize that the plan is not set to start until 2023. Mm -hmm. So there you have to, this has to, there has to be some planning along the way, and I'm not sure that all the numbers are mm -hmm. crunched at this point. I, I know it. Uh, Madam Chair and Chair Liebling, it just sounds a little bit like uh, we need to pass it to see what's in it. That is my concern. Um, so you don't have to elaborate on that. I, I just I wanted that clarification that we have no idea. Well, the core of this program, we have no idea what the premiums are going to be. And that and then how do you know that well, we can manage that risk without knowing that? But I'd like to ask something else. Well, well let me finish. Chair Chair Liebling. If, if I could just finish answering your question, you know, part of this, too, in terms of affordability, you asked how is the platinum plan going to be affordable because they're really expensive now. Remember, this is coupled with a bunch of affordability pieces that I've talked about that are not in this very bill that, that we're going to hear separately. And that is where people will not have to pay more than 9.8 percent of their income. Right now, you have that if you're under 400 percent of federal poverty. That will we'll get rid of the cliff and will extend that assistance higher up so that people will be able to afford the plan. Now, um, they can still, of course, choose to buy other plans, but they will be able to afford this plan. Will, without assistance? I, I don't know. Maybe not. But, um, you know, the, the goal here is to have access to health care and, I think, to preserve the individual market, which I won't talk about that again. But if you're going to do that, you, you can't, um, you know, I, everybody who thinks that, um, you know, if this is just terrible, we should just have competition, I guess I would ask, you know, where's your plan? Representative Haley. Madam Chair, thank you for follow-up. Um, switching to the pharmaceutical portion of the, of the program, um, you've said that the state will have its own formulary. And I want, I'd like clarification if the rebates then will go back to the enrollee and how do we prevent um, what's been said in, in earlier bills and earlier testimony that uh, PBMs are a problem because uh, they move away from generics to brand name drugs in order to get increased uh, rebates? So how are we going to prevent that the state isn't going to follow that same path? Chair Liebling. Well, Madam Chair, and I might need some assistance with this one, but the state does not operate a PBM. We have the portion of our, of our um, public program uh, population that is under fee-for-service right now. So their drug benefit is already being managed directly by the state without a PBM. 
So the state does this now all the time. This is not anything new and unusual. It just means moving the rest of the population out of the current thing into the, um, this uh, benefit that about a quarter of our enrollees already have. So this is not creating a brand new uh, unknown untested system. So I think Ms. Zimmerman can probably speak more to the details of that. Um, so I'll stop there if you want her to do that. Commissioner Zimmerman. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Haley. So the rebates that we collect now for the Medicaid program do go to directly offset the cost of the program. So any rebates that we would collect for the one care buy-in program would do the same thing. They would go to offset the overall costs and therefore the premiums of the program. For that program, I maybe just want to make one distinction that I think we talked about before in a previous committee. Um, for Medicaid, the federal drug rebate program that's only available for Medicaid is much different and much larger um, than it is for Minnesota Care or anything that you can get as sort of a supplemental rebate. It's really the pricing of being on the preferred drug list, which is where we get quite a bit of the savings. We get that for Medicaid too, but I just want to be clear that the federal drug rebate program for Medicaid is something that's very distinct and exists in federal law. Uh, Representative Haley. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the response. Just, again, want to be clear, it says in the bill that this establishes an outpatient prescription drug formulary. So that, that, that is what we are doing, and we all know it's this kind of perverse incentive in order to get the rebates, is what you're saying, which is going to lower the cost. In order to get the rebates, or the highest rebates would come from um, brand name drugs versus generic. So I, I just see, I see risk there to the state and I also see risk to the, the patients. But in interest of time, can I move on to one final question? Go ahead, Representative Haley. Um, if in our current system, we have a withhold from the health plans, the state withholds a certain percentage and, and pays it back in, in the following fiscal year. And so when you look at the financial modeling for one care, uh, this is a, a, a fiscal issue, if you can describe how the state is going to deal with that, that buyback and how that um, affects, frankly, the, the, the cost of one care. Ms. Zimmerman. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Haley, uh, so there's uh, several different fiscal pieces and some of them are costs and some of them are savings in the one care package. So that is correct. There is a cost to um, the, the managed care withholds and payment delays for the dental portion and for the prescription drug portion. Those costs are being offset by the savings that are coming in from the prescription drug benefit. Uh, I'll just close with, Haley. I, if I if I read right and in the governor's own revised budget forecast, it was stated that the buyback of the withhold could offset state savings. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. One more question regarding the formularies, please, on the um, system that's in play there. I was just wondering about who's selecting the drugs that would be on the formularies and how that system would play out in the long term. I know in other countries where there are more options, that tends to drive prices for prescription drugs down, whereas here we're in the exact opposite trajectory and even generics are on a trend of increasing costs toward branded prices and when they they can make more money by rebranding them, that's the course pharmaceutical companies often take. So I'm just wondering about if that will indeed be a, not, not, an, not a real market still, but if it will be part of the equation to lower prices of drugs. Commissioner Zimmerman or someone else? <coughs> yep. Okay, please state your name for the record. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Chad Hope with the Department of Human Services. Um, I oversee the pharmacy program, and one of the components within the current pharmacy program is a drug formulary committee. So it's a committee of licensed and actively practicing physicians, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, various healthcare providers throughout the state. 
what we do is we look at the various drugs and evaluate whether or not they should be subject to a prior authorization, placed as preferred or non-preferred on the preferred drug list to build a clinically appropriate um, option and menu for providers to choose from and have the best value for the state as well. So what we would envision is tapping into that exact same process that we currently use today. It's open, transparent, public can come, witness the meetings, give testimony, and then all the decisions are made very much in public. Thank you very much, that's a, that's a good help. Um, and then just, there's been a lot of debate and comments that we've heard today as far as um, the problems with our healthcare system but the cost of health care and the things that we're buying from services to drugs to um, medical equipment, those are all knowable price points. I mean, we, it's known around the rest of the world what those things cost. So that we can, we can discern and we can take an inventory and figure out what cost should be. And it seems to me a, a better system is essential for us at this time when all we've seen is rising costs, health insurance companies have been on a price increase and value and profit trajectory for over 20 years. And I think there's a lot of us who are tired of that and we need to address it head on. There's a lot of things we can do. Uh, the, the free market in medicine and, and the free market in medical care, I think that ship has sailed and it's going to cost our state. We heard in committee here that we pay 57 billion in health consumed dollars in this state and it's on a trajectory in 10 years to hit 94. So unless we have that, some real answers and solutions and government is part of the solution here. I think the healthcare system is different than free markets. And you know, a couple of years ago, I didn't believe that. And I thought more choices would be the solution, but the more I read about it and, and Representative Grunhagen, I have not read your book yet, but thank you for the copy. <laughs> and, and for the record, I haven't charged him. Okay. And, <laughs> true, true. But there's a lot of good information out there, and I just hope we can continue as a committee to work forward and to look at solutions for the people of Minnesota and uh, just keep up the good work. Thanks, uh, Representative Bierman. Madam Chair, my name was mentioned. Can I just say one quick thing? Oh, <laughs> I suppose, Representative Grunhagen. Uh, you are generous. I am. <laughs> No, we haven't had a free market in health care since 1965, just for the record, okay? But I think we can all agree here that we do have to do something about the cost growth in health care. Amen. Right? Amen. Good. We agree on something. Perfect. Uh, Representative Kentrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, uh, and Chair Liebling. Uh, to Representative Bierman's excellent question and excellent point, um, uh, going back to the Drug Formulary Committee, which is uh, an integral component in this plan as to how um, the drugs that would be covered under this formulary would be determined. Um, uh, and, and I'm sorry if I missed if this question was answered, um, but how does, how does the, the process through which the Drug Formulary Committee would select a drug, whether it be generic or non, um, as opposed to, let's say, how a PBM would select which drugs they put on their on their formulary. Is there some transparency difference, perhaps? Mr. Hope, please state your name for the record again. Madam Chair, Chad Hope with the Department of Human Services. How the formulary committee operates, we bring recommendations to the drug formulary committee as to whether or not um, we would recommend a drug be preferred or non-preferred. The formulary committee then essentially debates the merit of such a, a recommendation based on the clinical appropriateness. So are we treating the appropriate conditions, allowing for various treatment options, et cetera. Unfortunately, the pricing transparency we're not able to provide in the public because of a federal prohibition that prevents us from discussing pricing or rebates. So that information we do have to use in-house, but what the formulary committee does is it evaluates the clinical aspects of the preferred drug list. So they may, 
they may look at the list and say, yes, we need to add another drug. We need to add a solution for folks with uh, swallowing problems, for example. Um, so it's very, very clinical. But what what does not exist within our formulary committee with versus what you've heard with the PBMs, there is no rebate incentive for the state. The, we don't generate any profits from rebates. We want the lowest net cost drugs that are clinically appropriate, whether that be brand or generic. Um, honestly, getting the lowest cost for a generic drug is better than getting the rebate on a brand name drug because you don't have to float the cost of the drug and wait for the rebate to come in six months later. So there's none of that incentive and there's no profit generated for the department off of rebates. Thank you. Representative Cantrell, follow up. Oh. Very briefly, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much for, for that answer. And, and I would like to also um, kind of draw members' attention to um, lines 11.28 and 11.29, where uh, the, the Drug Formulary Committee has to hold, is required to hold in this piece of legislation, a public forum and receive public comment. Um, so this differs significantly from how, let's say, a PBM would function. Um, because I could I could write letters to my PBM all day, but I don't think that they take me very seriously, uh, and they probably wouldn't be super transparent about the process through which they would determine which drugs they're going to cover and which drugs you know that they're they're actually going to pass on the benefits to me for. So I just wanted to, to outline that this really uh, the the underpinning of this policy is in its transparency, and that's what I really appreciate about this plan. So I appreciate your answer, and I appreciate uh, your time, Chair Liebling and Chair Schultz. Okay, thank you. So. There are no more member questions, but we have an A14 amendment. Madam Chair. Oh, sorry, Ms. Representative Noor. Um, Madam Chair, uh, the question that I have that many people haven't talked much about it is the major problem that we have right now with dental care, uh, which this bill brings some streamlining, creates an opportunity whereby we have the recipients who are on Minnesota Care and those who are receiving a medical assistant program, both in managed care and fee for service, this program will streamline the process for them. Uh, and for those who live in greater Minnesota, it's going to reduce the wait time. It's going to provide a care that most of us don't usually look into that. I have been to many places and hospitals. I've seen the doctors talk about a dental care that became a major health care problem because of the weight and lack of a programming to help those individuals who are seeking the help. So the question that I have is, how will this look like once this program uh, is implemented in 2022? Chair Liebling. Well, thank you for that question, Representative Neuer and Madam Chair. Um, I think that uh, some of it, you know, uh, I, we need to work with the rates because there's no question that Minnesota pays very low rates and that is part of the problem that we have with dental access for people on our public programs. But I think that, so I would not say that this piece of legislation solves all problems, even in the area of dental care where it, it does take a big step forward. But what I would say is that it makes it more possible for us as policymakers to have impact on the problem. So um, I think that, that that is the big step forward that it makes. I, I don't pretend that, um, as I said at the outset, um, you know, the rate structure in the bill is not one that everybody's comfortable with, especially me. But, um, but that, that can continue to be worked on. We need to do work on that. But it will make it so much easier to do that rate work, to have a better understanding of you know, what costs are in different parts of the states, of the, of the state. Um, and uh, one of the, one of the um, thoughts um, as, this, as we've worked on this has been to, um, you know, let, um, you know, county-based purchasing also manages dental. And sometimes they've done much better with access for the people who are getting their health care through county-based purchasing. Um, and so maybe it would be to set a threshold to say that if, uh, if uh, county-based purchasing or an HMO is um, hitting a target of, of access, that maybe we would let them continue to manage it. That's just one thought that we might explore. But um, I just think this gives us an opportunity to start to solve the problem instead of just always um, kind of admiring it, which we've, we've done a lot of because we've had a real difficulty. I mean, 
legislators, both Republicans and DFLers, have really struggled with this. And our constituents tell us about it all the time, that they cannot find a dentist. Supposedly they have care, they have coverage, and they can't get access. And I, I don't know about you, but I've felt very helpless to be able to solve that problem. So I think this helps move us forward. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Representative. Any other questions? So I think we would like to adopt the A14 amendment. So I'll move the A14 amendment. Um, would you like to speak about that? This, I think this is my amendment. It is, Madam <laughs> Chair. So I, I was going to ask you to, in fact, sure. I'll move it and you speak about okay, it. Okay, I will speak about it. This was <laughs> House File 273. This is the family glitch bill that fixes the family glitch. And um, Governor Walls has put, included this in his revised budget. And he, would, and he wanted it in the one care part of the package because it's part of the package to make health care more affordable for those families where they're, they're facing employer coverage that's more than 9.86% of their income. So this allows individuals to buy into the Minnesota Care program if they're eligible um, and they have excessive health insurance premiums because they're buying family policy through their employer. And this went through HHS policy. We incorporated some of the uh, um, recommendations in an amendment form that are here that um, Representative New brought forward. So I, I'm going to take a vote on this, and then we can have questions. So all in favor to adopt the A14 amendment on House File 3, say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK, amendments adopted. Any questions on the family glitch? And we've already had one testifier testify in support of this amendment. If not, final thoughts on the bill, Rep Chair Liebling. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think, uh, and thank you, members, for the robust discussion. Um, we're not going to solve all problems here, but I think that there are some really good forward thinking pieces of this bill. And I am <coughs> grateful for all the work that's been done by the agencies and by the governor's office to get this to where it is. And uh, would ask for your support. And um, would like to have this laid over for possible inclusion. Okay, the bill is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Division Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Chair Liebling. And next up is Representative Loeffler, House File 2459, and I'll give the gavel back to Chair Liebling. Oh, Madam Chair? Yes, Representative Grunhagen. I have to leave. I've got a business commitment. I'm not, I'm not leaving out of resentment or in fact, I'm you would quite, never do that. Yeah, I'm here. quite happy. I got to say what I wanted to say. Okay, okay. excellent. <laughs> but I will add this: there's a if you pass all the rest of these bills on health care, we're going to wind up with a two-tier health care system: one for the rich and the privileged, and a second-rate one for the rest of us. Rationed. Well, let's by make government. sure that doesn't happen. Well, and we're going to miss you, Representative Grunhagen. <laughs> Representative Loeffler, House File 2459. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would love uh, to move that House File 2459 be uh, considered uh, to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Health and Human Services Bill. I do have an A1 amendment um, that hasn't been distributed yet, but that it's a little tangential. I think we'll take it after the testimony uh, because it really addresses a, a different topic um, that we've been asked to uh, put into statute um, from a rider status. And um, this bill will continue the status quo. It will continue our current provider tax so that hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans across the whole, our whole state can continue to count on the comprehensive, affordable health care that they depend on and, and sometimes their lives even depend on. Uh, it's a short bill. It simply repeals the sunset that was imposed in the shutdown of state government during a special session some years ago of the provider tax that currently funds the health care access fund and care for many people. 26 years ago, 
Minnesotan uh, uh, in the legislature and in, in the governor's office on a bipartisan basis boldly created an ongoing comprehensive affordable system of health coverage for low and moderate income people who did not have access to employer paid um, or supported uh, health insurance. And it was a time of big uncompensated care in many clinics. Lots of people did not have insurance. Um, it, Unfortunately, we heard stories of people who uh, life was threatened by the fact that their cancer and other serious diseases were caught late because they didn't feel like they had access to early diagnostic care and, and early opportunities to, to address health issues when they first arose. And so 26 years ago, Minnesota Care was created in law funded by the provider tax. It is established. It has been absorbed into the market and our prices it, throughout the years. It has withstood legal challenges. We know we can count on it. And it's reliable. Uh, we have never had to use the provisions and statute that say we have to cut in off enrollment because we're worried we're re we'll be out of funds. We have never had to say to someone on Minnesota Care, we're canceling it. Not because you've been able to get a better job and a better income and no longer qualify, but because the state's run out of money. We've never had to do that, to turn people away in the middle of a course of treatment. We have never had to uh, raise the 2% uh, since it was initially in instituted. And it is proven, it's stable, it's reliable. Just the attributes that we all want to have in our health care. And for that reason, I believe it is our best option for continuing to have a reliable system of health care um, and health support for Minnesotans. Um, I will only, uh, before we go to witnesses, I will just call your attention to a uh, support letter in your packet. Uh, we have many of them, but one of them has over, I think it's 150 organizations throughout the state that have signed on in support of this proposal. All right, thank you. Representative Loeffler, um, so ready for test fires now. Absolutely. All right, um, Commissioner Malcolm, thank you for your patience, Commissioner. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Jan Malcolm, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health. Thank you so much for your consideration of, uh, of this bill in the future. As you know, this is a centerpiece of Governor Walz's budget proposal and his health care package. I think uh, that Representative Loeffler has done a wonderful job explaining the importance of the re retaining the provider tax to assure that we have stable funding for the health care access fund that is sufficient to support its many important purposes. Just a quick reminder, um, Representative Loeffler, Loeffler made the case clearly that how important the access fund is to assuring access to care for Minnesotans. I just want to remind you that uh, before the expansion of coverage uh, federally under the Affordable Care Act, the Institute of Medicine actually declared lack of insurance as one of the top 10 causes of premature death in our country. It matters whether people have access to coverage to get the care they need when they need it. But the access fund in Minnesota is not only about expanding access to care through expansion of coverage, it is also giving us tools to improve the quality and efficiency of care, to work directly to shore up provider capacity across our state in critical areas, and very critically, to invest in systemic efforts to turn the tide on health care costs and to improve the health status of Minnesotans by working on prevention. You've heard me in prior uh, committee hearings talk about the wide range of programs funded uh, within the Minnesota Department of Health by the, the Health Care Access Fund, those investments that are uh, critical to improving quality and cost effectiveness of the system and those investments which directly support uh, provider access, particularly in greater Minnesota. I also mentioned in prior testimony the importance of the statewide health improvement partnership and shared with you some projections that actually begin to quantify some of the positive effects that SHIP has had on bending the cost curve in our state. Uh, we looked at two particularly large drivers of avoidable cost in Minnesota, obesity and tobacco use, and we compared the trends in uh, growth in obesity and health care costs attributable to obesity as well as cost attributable, uh, excess costs attributable to smoking 
and traced the fact that the trend lines in Minnesota had decreased since the advent of SHIP and calculated that that was worth at least, in a very conservative estimate, $600 million in avoided uh, health care costs due to finally beginning to work systematically at a statewide level uh, to impact the significant drivers of a lot of health care spending, which is chronic disease attributable to some core risk factors. So you've heard all of that testimony from me before. I won't repeat it here today, uh, except to say, as Representative Loeffler has already clearly said, the, the stability and the solvency of the access fund is directly tied to the provider tax, and its retention uh, this year is absolutely critical to not imperil the fiscal solvency of the programs, to not imperil health care access for Minnesotans, and to not imperil the strategies that we have in place to begin to turn the cost curve and most fundamentally to improve the health of Minnesotans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Let's go then to uh, Marie Zimmerman. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, my name is Marie Zimmerman. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Healthcare and the State Medicaid Director for the Department of Human Services. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify today. The sunset of the provider tax, uh, as Commissioner Malcolm referenced, really threatens the financial stability of our public programs, Medicaid and Minnesota Care, that provides coverage for almost 1.2 million Minnesotans. Um, in fiscal year 20, that amount is $585 million for both of those programs that is coming out of the Health Care Access Fund that is, per, that is funded by the provider tax. Uh, we cannot lose the provider tax without impacting those Minnesotans that are covered by these programs. Um, the loss of this funding would really force the state and the legislature uh, to make some difficult decisions around potentially reducing or eliminating benefits, around reducing eligibility, or cutting uh, provider payment rates. Uh, Minnesota is consistently ranked as one of the healthiest states in the nation, uh, not by accident, but by design. Um, our state has collaboratively and consistently made the decision to invest in health care by expanding coverage beyond the bare minimums. Uh, we provided expanded coverage, for example, for people with disabilities through our MAEPD program. We provided uh, extended, expanded coverage for pregnant women and children um, up to 275% of poverty. Uh, we also allow parents uh, that have children with disabilities to buy into Medicaid through the TEFRA option that we have uh, available. And some of those, I, I brought this with, but we, we used this a bit last year and we're providing an update to it. This Medicaid Matters booklet, I think, really provides a good explanation, one, of the program, but two, some of these optional benefits and categories of eligibility that we've, the state has chosen to fund over many years and sort of provides a good backdrop of where some of our spending is going as well. So I brought some of those uh, for members if they're interested. Um, absent an extension of the provider uh, tax, the state risks large cuts in the Health and Human Services budget and puts additional pressure on the state general fund. Um, these investments primarily support the health coverage of uh, Minnesota Care and Medicaid, which pays for uh, more than half of all nursing home costs. Uh, half of all of the substance use uh, treatment, and more than 40% of all births in the state of Minnesota. Uh, our Minnesota neighbors get affordable health coverage through Minnesota Care and Medicaid, which makes a huge quality of life difference for them. Um, Mike, who was a dairy farmer that I got to meet um, in St. Cloud uh, about a week and a half ago with uh, Governor Walls, said that Minnesota Care is the one bill he looks forward to uh, receiving every month because it means that uh, he's going to get the coverage that he needs without losing everything if something happens to him. Um, we don't often hear people say that they're looking forward to their health care premiums that they, they receive in the mail. Um, the effects of losing this critical funding uh, would be devastating for the program. Uh, to demonstrate the value of the lost revenue to the Health Care Access Fund, our uh, wonderful budget team put together a sample of those essential services. I know that uh, Commissioner Lori shared some of this last week, but just for an example, to make up even 15% of the funding provided by the Health Care Access Fund through the provider tax would require the legislature to get rid of the MAEPD program, to eliminate the TEFRA option for kids kids with disabilities, um, to take away uh, MA coverage for uh, adult dental, chiropractic services, uh, PT, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, uh, hearing, and vision, 
uh, to remove enhanced housing support rates for most residences and to cap the CADI and DD waiver growth. Uh, we need to continue the provider tax by repealing the state's uh, sunset and state law. Repealing the sunset helps support health care for more than 1.2 million Minnesotans so they can get the care they need. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Ms. Zimmerman. Um, Laura Sales. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Representative Liebling and members. My name is Laura Sales, and I'm a lobbyist with the Minnesota Nurses Association. We're a labor union of about 22,000 members that live and work all over Minnesota and parts of Iowa, Wisconsin, and North Dakota. We're here to testify in support of House File 2459, which would delete the sunset of the pro provider tax in order to ensure that funding source continues. The health care provider tax funds essential health care services for thousands of Minnesotans and enables critical investments in the health and well-being of Minnesota's communities. If the provider tax expires, the loss of funding will jeopardize health care for thousands of low-income Minnesotans, threaten the stability of the health care sector in Minnesota, and negatively impact the state budget. Since it was first enacted in 1992, the provider tax has provided a stable source of income for the health care access, access fund and the Minnesota Care Program. It is also time tested in terms of the state already having the structures and systems in place to continue to collect it. And lastly, with uncertainty at the federal level, the decision by the current administration to not defend the Affordable Care Act as an example, it is important we have adequate funds to protect the programs that are funded through this mechanism. Nurses see the effects of a healthcare system in which patients do not have access to affordable and timely health care. Things like patients foregoing preventative care, not filling prescriptions or allowing conditions to pro progress to advanced stages because of the high cost and inaccessibility of health care are things that nurses see every day. Allowing the provider tax to sunset will either exacerbate these kinds of things because fewer people will have access to health care or it will mean that elected officials will have to make cuts to education or transportation funding, for example, to make up for the loss of the income from the provider tax. We urge you to support House File 2459. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Elsie Ehrman. <laughs> and then after, after her will be Dave Renner, Barty Wahi, Mary Krinky, and then Dominique McQuarrie. So if you could all be ready to come up. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Elsie Ehrman. I live in Centerville. That's right next to Hugo. And Ms. Ehrman, almost, you might need to pull the microphone just oh, a bit I'm closer. Sorry. Better? Thank you, okay. yes. For almost 40 years, I've worked in a Twin Cities clinic, most of that time as an LPN. I am a member of SEIU Healthcare Minnesota. We support House File 2459 because much of the care we provide depends on the $600 million a year generated by the provider tax. SEIU members all over the state know that our health care system depends on the provider tax. Some of you think that this may be an opportunity to eliminate wasteful spending from the system. Let me tell you how our health care system wastes valuable resources. One patient in particular has always stuck with me. She was a young woman in her mid-20s. For several years, I helped with her treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. She was lively, kind of a spitfire, fully functional and doing well. But then her father lost his job and she lost her insurance. I didn't see her for a year or two, but eventually she got insured again and returned for care, except now she was a different person. She was unable to walk and confined to a wheelchair. She lost much of the use of her hands. She was unable to do many of the simplest tasks that all of us take for granted. Her life, once full of promise, had been reduced to the narrow confines of the bare essentials. All of this could have been prevented if we were able to maintain the care she had been receiving. Nothing is more wasteful than letting a treatable illness destroy a patient. There is no better investment than preventing people from getting sick or treating a disease before it gets worse and damages a person forever. We have the tools and the resources to give Minnesotans the care they need to live decent lives. The provider tax is one of those tools. Please don't let it sunset. Please let health care workers keep giving people the care they need. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Dave Renner. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. Uh, Madam Chair and members, Dave Renner at the Minnesota Medical Association. Um, I would suggest that there's two distinct questions before you that, that are being muddled into one. One is, uh, how do we provide ongoing stable funding to the Health Care Access Fund? 
And the second is, do we continue the provider tax? And we would argue those are two separate questions. The MMA supports the goal of the author and many of you at the legislature uh, and the advocates that we need to make sure that we have funding for our critical healthcare safety net programs, our access programs, and that that be an ongoing stable funding source. We do not support, however, uh, House Bill 2459. Uh, I would remind you that the legislature and Governor Dayton uh, uh, approved a bipartisan agreement in 2011 to, to sunset the provider tax. Uh, we think that that commitment should continue. Minnesota is the only state in the nation that, ha that assesses a provider tax like ours on a broad group of providers that includes not only hospitals, but medical clinics, dentists, chiropractors, psychologists, optometrists, and more. Um, there is an administrative burden uh, on these entities, especially the small clinics, to not only collect that tax, make those quarterly payments, but also um, sit for potential periodic audits. Um, we believe to ensure our, uh, our access programs have adequate funding, we ask you to consider looking at alternative funding sources. One idea that we have put on the table is uh, to maintain funding um, based on healthcare expenditures, but to move the collecting and the, and the paying of that tax upstream from the nearly 8,000 different providers that currently pay the, this tax to sm much smaller uh, number of payers through a, claims, a paid claims assessment. We continue to support your efforts to continued to, to, for continued coverage for low-income Minnesotans, as well as funding the many programs that Commissioner Malcolm suggested, like uh, uh, referred to as SHIP and the Office of Rural Health and the Economics Program. We ask you to think creatively to find funding that will allow the legislature to maintain its commitment to repeal the provider tax, and we stand ready to work with you and other legislators to find ongoing funding so our patients will have access to those programs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Barty Wahi. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Barty Wahi and I am the Executive Director of the Children's Defense Fund of Minnesota. We are here to enthusiastically testify in support of House File 2459 because the provider tax uh, funds essential health care services that directly benefit hundreds of thousands of Minnesotan children every year. We are in a moment when we cannot afford to reduce or experiment with our health care fund sources. For the first time in more than a decade, uninsured rates across, across the country are increasing. Here in Minnesota, we enjoy an uninsured rate for children at 3%. However, that rate has stagnated over the last year for the first time in a decade. <coughs> Letting the provider tax sunset will set the state back and put children at risk. The provider tax Provider tax revenue also includes a significant portion of the state's contribution to medical assistance, an insur a health insurance program that provides coverage for nearly 40% of the state's children, as well as the working poor, seniors, and people with disabilities. Research shows that medical assistance not only improves child health, uh, child health now and in the future, but improves immediate and uh, long-term uh, academic, social, and emotional uh, outcomes. It is without dispute that the provider tax uh, funds critical health services, but it also, um, it also provides and plays a critical role in providing equitable access to health care across, uh, across the state for our children. Moreover, we cannot emphasize enough the critical role medical assistance plays in providing coverage to rural Minnesotans, as well as ensuring rural hospitals and clinics have the resources to continue to support their community. Letting the provider tax expire would put at risk the health care of uh, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans in rural communities and especially children. Madam Chair, we thank you for hearing uh, House File 2459 today and we urge you and the whole committee to support it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Mary Crinky. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and members, for the record, my name is Mary Krinke and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. The Hospital Association supports Representative Loeffler's bill and the elimination of the sunset on the provider tax and to keep the provider tax in place. Uh, we find that to be somewhat unique within the provider community, but we really do believe it is the right thing to do for all Minnesotans. Um, over the last two decades, the Hospital Association has somewhat had a conversion on the provider tax. We really appreciate the good things that the provider 
gender tax is doing, particularly providing coverage for low-income Minnesotans. The question that I get asked the most, quite frankly, is how does the provider tax impact our rural hospitals? And I just would like to share with you three very quick pieces of information. Number one, the provider tax is not applied to Medicare. We often forget that, but it is not applied to any Medicare services. So for our rural hospitals, 50 to 60 percent of their patients are on Medicare. So there is no provider tax on Medicare. Number two, the federal government has recognized the provider tax as an allowable expense on the Medicare cost reports for critical access hospitals. So we have 77 critical access hospitals in Minnesota, and they are allowed to have the provider tax on their cost reports. And the last one I'd point I'd like to make is that rural hospitals generally have small volumes. And so with small volumes, they lack economies of scale. And any uptick, any uptick in the uninsured rate really affects our rural hospitals the most. And the provider tax protects that coverage for both Minnesota Care and the medical assistance program. So it really affects the rural hospitals more if there's a change in the uninsured rate. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your consideration of our comments. Thank you, Ms. Krinke. Dominic McQuarrie. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Dominic McQuarrie. I'm public policy manager at the Amherst H. Wilder Foundation and co-convener of the This Is Medicaid Coalition. This Is Medicaid is a broad coalition of more than 50 organizations, and we work to protect the health care of Minnesotans who get that care through Medicaid. We support the full repeal of the sunset of the health care provider tax and wish to add our voice to the letter of support that you received from more than 140 organizations from around the state who support the repeal of the sunset of the health care provider tax and House File 2459. Minnesota has long led the nation in providing affordable health care to our families, neighbors, and communities. Still, our health care system is imperfect. We need to build our mental health system, invest in services to keep people with disabilities in the community, ensure our seniors have safe care in the final chapters of their lives. Minnesota's communities, rural, metro, and everything in between can only thrive if people get the health care that we need, and we won't get there by moving backwards. <clears throat> A key linchpin in our health care system in almost every state's health care system is the health care provider tax. It's the time-tested, court-tested, and reliable revenue source around the nation. We often forget in these debates about health care and taxes, like it or not, our fates are intertwined with those of our neighbors and fellow Minnesotans. These debates are about each of us and the people we love. We do not know what the future holds for the health of those we love in our state, but we do know that we want them to have access to the care that they need when they need it. We also know that federal policy actions, such as the Justice Department's recent support of efforts to repeal the ACA in court, are threatening the exact programs, medical assistance, and Minnesota care, which the provider tax helps support. Rolling back the clock and letting the provider tax will take us back to a time when we had more Minnesotans subject to the real provider tax, on, or the real tax on the sick, the tax of being uninsured, sick, and out of options. Minnesotans cannot afford to see the provider tax or a liable source to help improve the health of Minnesotans for more than 25 years disappear. Thank you, and don't let the sun set. Thank you very much for your testimony. You may have noticed I'm wearing the button. <laughs> don't let the sun set. Okay, um, so we've had, um, well, I should ask, um, is there anyone else who wants to testify on House File 2459? Please come up if you wanted to testify on 2459. So, Hello, Madam Chair. Hello, please. Committee members. State your name and go ahead. Uh, my name is Christian Franzen, and I'm here today on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties. Uh, the Local Public Health Association, as well as the Minnesota, Minnesota Association of County Social Services Administrators. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the author of the bill for bringing this to, to us. And I would also simply like to say that we enthusiastically support the bill in preserving the Health Care Access Fund and a key preventive program like SHIP. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Um, please come down, sir. Welcome to the committee. Please give us your name and go ahead and give us your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Bob Robbins. Uh, I am testifying in support of HF 
2459. Uh, Many say that the provider tax is passed on to patients. If the provider tax goes away and all providers do not drop their rates by 2%, the patients will continue to pay this tax, even though the state gets none of it. In other words, the providers get a state-provided increase. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your testimony. And... Please step on up. Welcome to the committee. Welcome. Uh, yes, my name is Patsy Murphy, and I've had epilepsy since infancy from multiple head traumas caused by abuse. Then, when I was 26, I experienced a traumatic brain injury at the Minnetonka Summerfest. I fell off of a golf cart. Doctors at that time predicted I would remain in a persistent vegetative state. But after four days, I miraculously woke up. Now that was in 1991. Today, I still suffer from the long-term effects of my TBI. I have short-term memory problems, communication difficulties, and I find it difficult to stay organized and on track with my tasks. Now, my disability may be invisible, but I am not. I am active advocate with the Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance and come to the Capitol to share my story to protect access to health care and to make Minnesota better for people with disabilities. Medicaid has been a lifesaver for me. I do not know where I would be if, it hadn't, if I had not had medical assistance. Because after my accident, Medicaid allowed me to access rehab, which has changed my life and got me to where I am today by being able to see a doctor when I needed one and to get the medication that I was needed. That has helped me control my seizures and gain back the cognitive function that I lost after my injury. Medicaid helped me in my time of crisis to stay independent and active in my community. It is important that those who need Medicaid have access to this program and other programs funded by the Health Care Access Fund when they need it. These cuts and the huge hole left in the budget if the provider tax sunsets will make it even more difficult for programs for people such as myself with disabilities to get critical funding and for Minnesotans to stay healthy in their communities. Medicaid helped me in my time of crisis and it is important for both people with and without disabilities to have health care when they need it. Please support House File 2459. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else who wants to testify on House File 2459? All right, not seeing anyone. Um, so, Representative Loeffler, there's an amendment that's been handed out. Would you like to move the amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A1 amendment. And what this does is it puts into statute a provision that we have often put into our budget bills as a rider. And for the freshmen on the committee, riders and budget bills basically last for that two-year period. And if you put it in the statutes, it's the law of Minnesota on an ongoing basis. And what this does is it provides that the state will pay in its freights through medical assistance, Minnesota care, the provider tax. So it is, it is fully covered uh, for state-funded services and public programs. Okay, um, are there questions to the amendment or discussion to the amendment? Okay, not seeing any. Um, so, um, so Representative Loeffler has moved the A1 amendment. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. And are there other testifiers, Representative Loeffler? No, there are not, so. Madam Chair. Are there, I don't see any questions or any discussion. So um, thank you very much for, to all of the testifiers. And um, so House File 2459, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Thank you so much, members. Thank you. And for witnesses. Okay, let's see. 
All right, we'll take up House File 2359, Representative Schultz. Okay. Is this, did we do this? Yes. <laughs> Representative Schultz moves that House File 2359 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS finance omnibus bill. Representative Schultz, why don't you go ahead and uh, present your bill. I believe there's an amendment. Okay, let me. All right. Okay. So we have the A1 amendment before us, and this is to get the bill in the shape in which the author would like to discuss it. Yes, it is. Okay, so Representative Schultz moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. To your bill as amended. Okay, Madam Chair, members, House File 2359 is the premium subsidy bill as proposed by Governor Walls. So starting in plan year 2020, it requires Minsure to operate a program to provide subsidies to eligible individuals who purchase health insurance through Minsure. And it's a 20% discount on the cost of the insurance. And then the amendment we just adopted is um, the uh, tax credits, advanced premium tax credits at the state level to make health insurance bought on the exchange more affordable for those who get no help, um, um, don't buy a, a public program, and don't get help with um, um, other subsidies. Uh, below 400% of the federal poverty level. So it helps address the cliff that many people face uh, when their income may be slightly above that threshold uh, where they don't qualify for the federal advanced premium tax credits. And we do have some testifiers okay. that uh, we may want to bring forward. All right, is Commissioner Kelly here? Yes, thank you for your patience, Commissioner Kelly. I know you've had to wait quite a, quite a while. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair and members, I'm Steve Kelly. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Commerce for Minnesota, and I wanted to uh, thank uh, you for uh, uh, hearing this bill and Representative Schultz for uh, acting as the chief author for the governor's proposal regarding a 20 percent um, premium subsidy. And since um, the, commi the committee had, was uh, kind enough to have me here for a lengthy discussion of uh, the difference between uh, the governor's 20 percent proposed premium subsidy and the reinsurance program, I will not repeat any of that uh, testimony previously, I will only say uh, that um, we are uh, confident that um, this program will be a benefit to Minnesotans, especially uh, if when it is combined with the state-based um, tax credit and that it will be helpful for Minnesotans regardless of where they live and regardless of what age they are. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, maybe um, since you probably, we probably should let you leave, maybe I should see if members have questions of you right now before we go on to the next testifier. Are there any questions, members? I don't see any, so thank you very much, Commissioner. Madam Chair and Representatives, thank you very much. All right. Next we have Commissioner Bowerly. Welcome. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for uh, your time this afternoon. My name is Cynthia Bowerly. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Revenue. As you've heard from uh, Chair Schultz, the health insurance premium subsidy and the state-based health insurance tax credit are before you in this bill now with the amendment. 
Uh, currently, Minnesotans with an annual income in excess of 400% of the federal poverty guidelines for a family of four, that's about $103,000. They do not qualify for, this, for any state or federal assistance when they enroll in a qualified health plan through the exchange. And so this credit will ensure that employees with income over that 400% uh, in that private insurance market will pay no more than approximately 10% of their income on health insurance premiums. A couple of examples, uh, <coughs> using this tax credit the, and the 20% premium subsidy that my colleague Commissioner Kelly just mentioned, for ex a, example, a 61-year-old in St. Cloud with an income of $55,000 who enrolls in a silver plan with monthly premiums of $693 will receive a credit of $316 in this tax credit, reducing their monthly premium to $377. For a couple in Anoka with an income of $75,000, enrolled in a bronze plan with a monthly premium of $1,021, they would receive a tax credit of $593, reducing their monthly premium to $428. So a customer can choose to have this state-based credit paid in advance when they enroll in the exchange, or they can uh, choose to have that as a refundable credit, which they would claim on their regular income tax form. So there would be not in any additional forms for customers and the Department of Revenue will uh, true up the program to ensure that uh, the right amount is paid to uh, those uh, customers. So in this program, we expect that over 45,000 Minnesotans would qualify for the credit. Uh, that would include over 34,000 Minnesotans already in the individual market and over 13,000 uninsured Minnesotans who would join the market and enroll because of the credit. Uh, the amendment uh, that you all uh, just adopted also includes a very uh, small update to address a Supreme Court decision in, in, in Wayfair versus South Dakota. This will ensure that there's fairness for brick and mortar uh, locations in Minnesota who sell such things such as hearing aids, prescription eyewear, or wholesale drugs. So now we are ensuring that remote sellers into Minnesota will also be covered uh, and pay their fair share so they're in a level playing field with those who uh, sell those things in Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Chair Schultz for carrying this bill. We appreciate it so much, and I'd be happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there questions for Commissioner Bowerly? We don't, we don't get to ask a lot of tax questions in this committee, so now's the opportunity. Unbelievable. <laughs> okay, I don't see any. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Bentley Graves? Welcome to the committee. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I want to thank uh, the commissioners and uh, Governor Walls, Representative uh, Schultz, uh, for, uh, for bringing this proposal forward. The individual market is not one that most people associate uh, with uh, um, businesses or, or employers, but it is uh, a place where a number of entrepreneurs go uh, and self-employed individuals go to, to find coverage and increasingly it's a place where very small employers have turned to for coverage for themselves and their employees. Um, and uh, we're, we're very interested in, in um, uh, particularly the, the, the interplay between these two proposals and the impact that they would have in stabilizing the market and, and bringing relief to those that are, that are in the individual market. But we nevertheless have a few questions, particularly about the, the subsidy proposal. Um, uh, we have, we've been very appreciative of the state's uh, investment in the reinsurance program and the role that that has had in bringing down rates in the individual market and, and in particular bringing down kind of the sticker price of, of rates in the individual market. Um, and our questions about the premium uh, subsidy proposal largely revolve around kind of the interplay that it would have with that sticker price um, and the interplay that, that sticker price has in kind of overarching stability in the market. And so um, if I could just take a few minutes, uh, we do have a few questions I just kind of want to, to run through quickly, uh, knowing that uh, um, there's a number of other bills on the, 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 the agenda. But uh, first and foremost, you know, uh, the Department of Commerce has reported that over the last two years, uh, reinsurance has brought down rates at sticker price again um, by an average of 20% for the last two years. Um, and I think we're still struggling to know what exactly the impact uh, on the individual market rates of those headline rates or sticker price rates will be of not extending reinsurance and instead going forward uh, with a, a subsidy proposal. And if that proposal would result in an increase in those kind of headline rates or sticker prices, um, 
do we know how large that'll be and and uh, both again before and after the, the application of that 20 percent and again knowing that the goal of this program like reinsurance is market stability which itself hinges on robust participation in the market by individuals and families um, if the subsidy plan was result, would result in an increase in that kind of headline rate um, do we know what the impact of that would be on the overall market stability and the effort to keep people in and attract people to the individual market Similarly, do we know what types of outreach efforts will be undertaken to help individuals and families understand a who's eligible for that 20% subsidy and who's not? Um, how to receive the subsidy and then what other types of, of assistance are available to those that may not otherwise qualify for for that subsidy that being APTCs and cautionary uh, reductions. And Mr. Graves, we do need you to kind yep. of wrap up. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, this program is slated to be administered through Minsure, uh, which, uh, according to the budget documents, would would require the hiring of roughly 50 FTEs um, and the and the, the the build out of IT infrastructure to support it. And just you know, we have some questions about whether or not that's feasible to do between when this bill might pass and when open enrollment would start. And again, all those kind of underpin just questions about the difference between uh, the impact of reinsurance, which draws down those those headline rates, uh, and a program like this that that might come into the back end. Um, and, and again, what the impact might be on overarching stability, but, but nevertheless appreciate the focus on stability in the individual market in these programs uh, to, to help individuals that are in that market and, and uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Is there anyone else who wants to testify on House File 2359? I'm not seeing anybody, and I'm not seeing any member questions. Re Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a uh, uh, couple of process questions on this bill. It looks like it was introduced and, and sent here. Um, I did talk to Chair Halverson a little bit about um, the conference, uh, excuse me, the Commerce Committee and what kind of discussions they've had there. And I'm also noticing um, some data practices pieces there and wondering um, if civil law had taken any um, interest in any of this or if there had been discussions there. So I'm just wondering. Well, I, I don't know, uh, Representative Schumacher, what data practices pieces you're talking about. If you could, if you could direct my attention to that. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Lines uh, 3.11 through 3.16. Um, okay. Yeah. Representative Schultz, did you want to comment on that? With that um, judiciary did not request this bill, Representative Schumacher, and we had used um, a very similar system when we did the premium discount um, in 2017. So. Right, and Madam Chair, when we uh, did that uh, bill that last time, I remember that because that was the first time I had a bill up in my own uh, committee at that point, and we had three different versions, or three clones of that bill. One went to taxes, one went to uh, commerce, and one went to health and human services to to move this along. And um, so I'm, there were more stops than what we're seeing with this bill this time with that. And I'm, I just, I'm not sure on the the data sharing and the data practices points if that's something that they have to request or if that's um, just supposed to go there to to be reviewed. So. Just offering that. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you, Representative Schumacher. It's a good question, and I, I mean, this bill, um, there's some time, and um, you know, I guess we can find that out if the rules require that, um, or if the chair of civil law wants to see the bill, which I, I gather he does not. But um, the bill will, you know, once the bill, this is this is to be laid over. If it is in the omnibus bill, then, yeah, you know, the whole bill, as I mentioned before, goes to taxes. So we'll see if there are other stops that it has to make. Um, it may be very large, and so I hope that we don't have to make copies that are, you know, 800 pages and give them to every member to move it to committees. But it is going to it is going to move around some, so thank you for flagging that. We will, we will see if that is something that we need to take care of. Um, are there other questions from members? All right, not seeing any. Representative Schultz? So I just want to address some of the questions that came up um, from a testifier. 
So the premium subsidy program will reduce premiums by 20%. So the Commissioner of Commerce had made that comment publicly, um, the same amount that reinsurance would, but with a different effect, we will not lose federal subsidies for our BHP plan. So we will gain federal money. With reinsurance, there's a lot more uncertainty there than there is with the premium subsidy. Um, and I still believe with the premium subsidy that we were able to stabilize the individual market. Um, and the subsidy is comes right off of an individual's bill, so they don't. So the money is going to the health insurers, um, not to the individuals as a rebate. They just get a discount on their bill and they pay that bill. And the um, the FTEs that were mentioned from Minsure, those are for the call center and the IT build, um, indirectly related to the subsidy, uh, more related to an expected increase in enrollment um, on the market. Okay. Thank you, Representative Schultz. So if there are no further questions and no further discussion, House File 2359 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Thank you. So um, we will now take up House File 1182, Representative Freiburg. After that, we'll take up 2231, Representative Cantrell, and then 1785, Representative Wozniak. Welcome to the committee, Representative Freiburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as soon as I locate your bill, I will move it. Ah, thank you. So the chair will move House File 1182, that it be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Um, oh, 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 what happened? Okay. Okay. All right, go ahead, Representative Freiburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I greatly appreciate you fitting, fitting us in now. I have a testifier here who I know has to leave shortly. So a 1999 issue of the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report identified vaccination as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century, along with things like motor vehicle safety, control of infectious diseases, decline in deaths from coronary heart disease and stroke, and recognition of tobacco as a health hazard. The data bears out the tremendous public health benefit from vaccines. If you take the case of measles during 1958 to 1962, an average of 503,282 measles cases and 432 measles associated deaths were reported each year. Just let me repeat that, 432 people died each year from measles during that time frame. The measles vaccine was licensed in the United States in 1963, and the number of measles cases steadily dropped. In 1998, measles reached a provisional record low number of 89 cases with no measles-associated deaths. Yet that progress is under threat because of misinformation and doubts about the effectiveness of vaccines. In 2017, Minnesota experienced an outbreak of measles that sickened 75. Washington State is currently experiencing a measles outbreak that has sickened 71. Vaccination rates in Minnesota vary by county, with some counties below 90%. And a recent Star Tribune article highlighted the problem of inconsistent vac vaccination rates. One third of Minnesota schools are below the threshold for herd immunity, making the schools at higher risk of an outbreak. And this is not, these schools are not concentrated in a specific community. These are spread out throughout uh, demographics and throughout the state geographically. A recent Star Tribune Editorial stated that a public health campaign to counter vaccine disinformation is needed in Minnesota and elsewhere. House File 1182 would create such a program. It directs the Department of Health to develop and administer a grant program to fund outreach activities highlighting the benefits of vaccines. Another editorial noted that a grant program would encourage a tailored approach to vaccine outreach and education efforts. This is important when there's variation in rates not only between counties but between communities. Um, so you should have some materials in support of this from your packet. Um, this is a much needed bill and I encourage members to support it. I have a couple people here to testify. Uh, next to me is Saman Nurali, uh, who is the Quality and Patient Safety Specialist from Children's <laughs> Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. All right. Thank, Thank you, Representative Freiburg. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and give us your testimony. 
Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Simon Raleigh, and I am an employee of Children's Minnesota, the state's largest provider of pediatric health care. I am a quality and patient safety improvement specialist, and I was actively involved with the team at Children's Hospital who helped manage the 2017 measles outbreak. Our biggest need then and now is to combat misinformation about the MMR vaccine. I'm here today to represent Children's Minnesota and bring my own strong personal support of House File 1182. As you will recall, the Minnesota measles outbreak disproportionately affected the Somali community, with 61 of the 75 cases being in young Somali children. A total of 22 children needed to be hospitalized, with the longest admission being 17 days. We spoke at the time with many of their parents and recalled their fear and confusion about measles, the MMR vaccine, and autism. Parents told us they vaccinated their children except for one vaccine, the MMR, because they heard it caused autism. They heard there was no measles in the U.S. and that the triple shot was a thing to fear. When their Minnesota-born children were hospitalized with measles, their confusion and fear turned into panic, as many of them had seen measles in Somalia and knew it could end their child's life. Thankfully, no children died from measles in 2017, which was not the case in Minnesota in 1990 when three children died. By supporting House File 1182, you will help ensure parents get the right evidence-based information in their own community by trusted members of their community in a way they will understand and follow. This bill would help eliminate fear and promote truth and trust in public health and vaccinations in general, keeping all of our communities safe. Another Minnesota measles outbreak looms large, and with it, yet another public health crisis by passing this bill, your decision could fund local community education that could save lives. We at Children's Minnesota urge you to support the passage of House File 1182 for the safety of our kids and family. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and I know you have to leave right now soon, right? Yeah. So I would, uh, maybe we could see if members have questions for you. Sure. Uh, so that you can go if, if there are none. Thank you very much. Um, so any questions for this testifier? I'm not seeing any, so thank you very much. We thank you, Madam Chair, fun. members of the committee. And uh, one more testifier, I think. <coughs> yeah. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and committee, my name is Chris Ayersman, and I'm the uh, director for the Infectious Disease Division at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this bill. Statewide immunization coverage remain high and above protective thresholds, known as herd immunity, for all of the immunizations required for school. However, there are individuals in our communities that cannot be vaccinated for medical <coughs> reasons or cannot mount an immune response even if vaccinated. These people are often more vulnerable to and will suffer greater consequences from disease. We need herd immunity and minimal disease transmission to protect them. And as Representative Freiberg mentioned, the article in the Star Tribune on Sunday really did a nice job of highlighting this. Um, high aggregate vaccination coverage at a state or national level can really mask lower coverage in smaller populations. And we have pockets of under immunization um, across the state of Minnesota. I'm not using slides, so I can't refer to a, a graph we have of the state. We can share it with you, but it, it shows that throughout the entire state, we have pockets where um, kids are at risk for outbreaks. The 2017 measles outbreak that you heard about is an example, a dramatic example, and an expensive example of what can happen when disease is introduced into one of these vulnerable populations. Currently, the Minnesota Immunization Program is exclusively funded by federal grants and does not receive any state funding. Federal funds received are allocated for activities outlined in the federal grant, which include administering the Minnesota version of the Vaccines for Children program, outreach and education to providers, disease surveillance, and school and child care law compliance. For this reason, the immunization program has been limited in its ability to provide community outreach grants to, um, related to immunization. This legislation, as you heard, charges the department with establishing and administering a two-year targeted grant program to fund immunization-related activities to address outbreaks of vaccine-preventable disease and to lower the risk of outbreaks. It also requires the Commissioner of Health to develop and provide grant recipients with culturally competent information and educational materials on immunizations. 
The goal of the proposed grant program would be to develop and implement a funding program for community health boards, American Indian tribes, community-based nonprofit organizations, and other groups who are serving um, populations with low vaccination coverage and who are at risk for outbreaks of vaccine preventable disease. We anticipate the ability to fund seven organizations through an RFP process at $100,000 each during the two-year period. We would need to employ a full-time grants manager and a part-time health educator to implement this legislation. So in summary, overall coverage in Minnesota is high and meets the threshold for herd immunity. There are populations in the state, however, with low immunization coverage, putting them and others at risk for disease. Providing culturally sensitive targeted outreach to parents can help address their concerns and resume their confidence in vaccines, preventing disease outbreaks. This legislation pr provides funds for a two-year grant program to address communities with low immunization coverage levels. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the room who wants to testify on House File 1182? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Are there... Uh, and I'm not seeing any comments or questions from members. So, Representative Neuer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Freiberg. This is a good bill in terms of addressing the issue of immunization and also addressing the, the really the core issues of public health crisis that we see when, uh, when the incident of measles and other things happen in the community. So, I support the bill. So, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Neuer. All right. All right, final word, Representative Freiberg. Uh, I appreciate the committee's consideration of this important public health issue, and All right. thank you for your thank, time. Thank you for your work on this. House File 1182 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Finance Omnibus Bill. We will take up. Okay, we'll take up uh, House File 2231, Representative Cantrell. Representative Cantrell will move that House File 2231 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. <laughs> Representative Cantrell, your bill has been moved. You have moved your bill, so why don't you go ahead and present the bill. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I believe there's also an amendment to this bill. Yes. Um, Representative Cantrell, I think the, am the amendment, I don't know if, if you want to um, present what you have and then we can do the amendment. It, it's up to you. Um, usually I, when the amendment pertains to something different, we would first discuss your bill and then discuss the amendment. I think that's a phenomenal idea, okay. Madam Chair. So why don't right. you go ahead, because the amendment, I don't think it's been handed out yet. It's, it it's, the page has it, so it's, it's being prepared. So All right, ahead. excellent. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, present before the committee uh, one final time this session. Um, and I thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, for the opportunity to present House File 2231 before you today. Um, uh, House File 2231 really, really does two things. But before I kind of uh, elaborate on, on the nature of this bill, um, I want to outline that this bill was modeled after um, a report that was released recently um, by the Department of Human Services uh, in term, uh, regarding um, residential treatment and payment rate reform, um, a copy of which should be in everyone's packet. Yeah. And so this was released in November of 2018. We so, that. Yeah. oh, excellent, Madam Chair. Um, so this this bill really encapsulates um, some of some of the essence of the um, uh, of the suggestions contained in the report. Um, so the first thing that this bill does uh, is uh, it provides a much needed rate increase to substance use disorder treatment providers. Um, it, there's a, a, a blank appropriation, but I believe that we're looking at about $10 million to maintain access to treatment in Minnesota. 
The second thing this bill does is it requires DHS to work to establish a long-term sustainable substance use disorder reimbursement methodology that, uh, that truly covers and reimburses substance use disorder treatment providers for the continuum of care. As the cost of uh, providing these services has increased, uh, the reimbursement has not uh, at this point in time met the the cost needs um, of uh, of our substance use disorder treatment providers. Um, so we want to make sure that they are able to uh, pursue this providing this service in a way that is financially solvent while ensuring that all Minnesotans struggling with substance use disorder are able to get the essential services that they need. And that's really the essence of this bill is making sure that we expand accessibility to substance use disorder treatment providers um, so that we can, in the wake of, of this opioid crisis that our state is experiencing, this opioid tragedy, so we can make sure that everyone um, is able to have access to these providers and really get the treatment that they need. Um, so I'd like to just mention a few quick statistics to highlight the need um, for this bill. Only 10% of people um, who seek substance use disorder treatment uh, actually, are end up, uh, actually end up being able to get it. Um, and we know that when a person has reached the point at which they are ready to, to be able to pursue the, the long and arduous process of, uh, of getting assistance to overcome a substance use disorder, um, a, a lack of access to a, to a provider or being waitlisted can be devastating and, and, continue, or, and uh, derailing. Um, estimates are that addiction costs the United States approximately $400 billion per year in healthcare and public safety costs. Uh, and $7 billion of that per year in Minnesota alone. Um, studies have shown that there is a great return on investment uh, for when we invest in substance use disorder treatment. In fact, one study con uh, conducted by the federal government in 2016 indicated that for every $1 invested in substance use disorder treatment, uh, the state realizes a return of $12 in avoided costs in health care, criminal justice, and other societal costs. And that's not to mention oftentimes uh, the great cost in, in human life uh, that results from inaccessibility of substance use disorder treatment. So I thank you all members for the opportunity to present this bill before you today. Uh, and with that, I will turn the presentation over to my testifier. All right. Thank you, Representative Cantrell. Welcome to the committee. Please just state your name and go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is, uh, and members, my name is Tim Walsh. And I am with Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge, and I'm testifying on the behalf of March, which is the state's largest SUD treatment uh, provider and professional association in the field. Uh, I just want to tie into a few of the comments that Representative Cantrell uh, made, and thank you for, for um, uh, authoring this bill. Um, the opioid epidemic, the heroin epidemic, and actually we have an alcohol epidemic and meth surge going on all at the same time. And so that's going to increase the need uh, for treatment as these epidemics are ravaging our communities. Uh, if rates go down, of course, what happens is access is blocked because uh, treatment providers are not able to expand to meet the need. And we actually have uh, many providers who have said they're either going to have to shift to uh, commercial, uh, uh, commercially insured uh, pro um, uh, uh, clients, or uh, they uh, are going to have to combine with larger providers to achieve a, a scale that will allow them to be uh, efficient. And so we, we have providers who are under stress right now. We have two larger providers that reported to us that at this moment, uh, one of them is actually underwater. They're losing money. And the other one projects in one year without an increase, they're going to be underwater. They're going to be losing uh, money. So. Uh, to highlight a few things that have been talked about, we're asking for a $10 million investment in provider reimbursement rates to maintain this access to SUD treatment for Minnesotans. Um, uh, we support uh, rate methodology reform that's a part of this bill and also requires DHS to include providers in developing uh, that uh, rate methodology. Because only one in 10 uh, Minnesotans are receiving treatment right now that need it. Uh, of course, we need to maintain that access. 
And then finally, uh, I just want to highlight uh, the, the study that Representative Cantrell said, which is this is an excellent investment because, based on the National Institute of Health, there's a 12 to 1 return on any investment of dollars in substance use treatment. So, Madam Chair and members, I would be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Um, is there um, anyone else who wanted to testify on House File 2231? Yes, ma'am. Oh, please. Welcome. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Brandy Brink. I am here to testify as a person in recovery. I have many titles now um, that I uh, hopefully can get to. I've been given a challenge of trying to explain my story uh, and what treatment has done for me in my life in a very short period of time, which, um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I was very fortunate and blessed, as, as it's been explained, uh, to even get into a position to enter into treatment um, over three years ago. I um, was someone who struggled with addiction and um, was at a point that I did not have hope for my life moving forward. Um, I did not grow up, and I actually am a product of the foster care system through uh, my adolescence. I wasn't provided um, an understanding of how to deal with life on life's terms. Um, when I entered into treatment, not only was I able to address the issues of my addiction, I was given tools that I had not previously had in my uh, throughout throughout my um, adolescence into adulthood. Um, since since um, going to treatment three years ago, I have founded a recovery community organization in Blue Earth County. We've opened a women's sober house um, within uh, that serves Southern Minnesota. We've been able to help 29 women re-enter into the community from uh, jail, prison, and other treatment facilities. What having access to treatment has done for me, um, in turn, has allowed me to help so many other people that I, I didn't even know I was capable of doing with it myself. So I am absolutely grateful. I'm here to testify that I support this bill and I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm not usually in this scenario. Uh, when I share my story, it's among people that <laughs> have been or, uh, or have gone through the same thing. So I, I appreciate your patience with me and understanding of my nervousness. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Brink. And you never know when the people around have gone through the same yes, thing. Yes, that's so, true. <laughs> you know, so we appreciate this. And I just want to uh, say uh, I notice on the, the, um, well, the printed material here that you're your last name is Brink, and the name of your organization is Beyond Brink yes. Sober Housing, which I think is very cute and yes, clever. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> my so. board did that uh, against my vote, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your thank testimony. You. Is there anyone else in the room who wants to testify on House File 2231? Okay, so... Um, uh, we have a question from Representative Haley, and we'll, we'll, so we'll uh, finish with this portion, and then we'll take up the amendment. Representative Haley. Oh, I just have a clarification, Madam Chair, if we have the right amendment, the right language in the amendment. Well, there isn't an amendment yet. That, an amendment has not yet been moved, but are, we, are you talking about the A2 amendment? Yes, if, they, if you want to look at that. Well, I think I, I'm, I'm to understand there were changes in HHS policy, and so is this the new language well, that was reflected? But, well, I don't know, Representative Haley. Why don't we wait till we get to that amendment, and then we can, when we move the amendment, and we'll discuss it and see if that gets cleared up for you. Um, so are there any questions to the this part of the bill, uh, the, bill um, the unamended bill, or uh, to these testifiers? All right, seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. And um, so we do have the A2 amendment, and the chair will move the mm. A2 amendment. And um, actually, this amendment is um, 
from a bill that is being authored by Representative Moeller. So welcome to the committee, Representative Moeller. This might be your first time here, yes? It is, thank you, right, Madam welcome. Chair. Yes, Please so. tell us what's in the amendment. Great, thank you, Madam Chair and members, and thanks to Representative Cantrell for um, allowing me to, to have this amendment today. So this amendment would expand Consumer Directed Community Supports, or CDCS. It's an option for individuals accessing Minnesota's home and community-based service waivers, which offers people with disabilities and their family members more choice and control over their services and supports, um, specifically shared services. And shared services are structured similarly to the shared care option with the personal care assistance program. It would allow family members or friends to effectively share a single staff person to provide support in the home or in the community. Parents with multiple children with disabilities often do not want to have or cannot find one staff for each child in their home. So when multiple siblings access CDCS, shared services would allow families to stretch each child's budget, creating even more flexibility to meet individualized needs and provide consistency and staffing to ease some of our workforce challenges that I'm sure you've all been hearing about in committee. And the reason why I, I carried this bill and this amendment today is really because of a letter I received from a constituent of mine um, whose name is Lynn McDonald and she has two children, Adam and Becca, who both have Down syndrome. And this, um, this would really benefit her families and many like theirs in order to stretch their dollars and best meet the needs of their children. Um, this bill, before it was turned into an amendment, has uh, bipartisan support in both chambers. Um, so I hope you will support this amendment today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Muller. So, um, Representative Haley, did, do you want to, do, do you have a question at this point? Please go ahead. Uh, uh, maybe you, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Maybe you want to ask staff. I'm just confused if we actually have the right language in our packet packages for the amendment that Representative Moeller is referring to. Okay. Ms. Sunderman. Um, Madam Chair, members, I, I believe you do have the right language in the amendment that was, um, I believe it was House File um, 1285. 1285. Um, and this is amended language from that bill that is now being put on as an amendment to House File 2231. And if I could, Representative Haley, I'm not exactly sure what your confusion is, except that I do want to explain that, you know, as there, in, there is no uh, germaneness rule in committee. Yeah, no and so I don't know if that was the concern. Representative Zerwas? Um, Madam Chair, I think the, Madam Chair, I think the question is from this, this amendment seems to be from House File 1285, which was heard in policy was amended in policy, and I think there's confusion as to whether this is House File 1285 as introduced or House File 1285 as the committee uh, amended it. Okay. I think that's the confusion uh, right now, Madam Chair, that we would like to go. Because clearly if, if this went through policy, it went through Chair Moran's committee, and it was amended in that committee, and we're going to count that as saying it had a hearing, then we should... If we're going to add it in an amendment here, it should be the language as passed through that committee. I think that's the concern, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative Zerwas. I didn't understand the concern. Representative Muller, do you want to address that? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative um, Zerwas, for that question. So this bill was amended, as you noted, in policy, and then it, this is a further amendment which essentially strikes language out of the bill as it was amended in policy. We got rid of um, some of the cost provisions, and so this will make it actually more affordable and actually really get to what we want to do, which is the shared services piece. Okay, Representative Zerwas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I think that helps clear it up. Um, and I don't know if Representative Moeller, um, not to take up the committee's time, but just to describe for folks that um, perhaps saw it in uh, policy versus now, it just Understand that something was taken out to reduce the fiscal note. Just wonder if you could very briefly just kind of cover what that is so we're all on the same page. 
Yeah, Representative sure. Miller. Yes, Madam Chair, Representative Zerwes, I'd be glad to do that. So the bill, in addition to shared services, um, as it was heard in, in policy, also had two other components to them, to it. One was intensive behavioral support services, and it was pulling that out of the CDCS budget, and that was the, the piece that was really going to cost a lot of money. And then the other part of that was an educational piece to, to provide information to counties um, about CDCS so they could be offering it to more clients, which again had some money attached to it. So we pulled that away from the bill as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Representative Sir Russ. And I recall now hearing it in policy in those pieces as well. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Haley, for bringing that up. Okay, um, is there any further, let's see, did we adopt the amendment? No, no. no we have not adopted the amendment. Okay. okay, is there any further discussion on the amendment before we take a vote on it? Okay, seeing none. So um, uh, Representative Cantrell moves the A2 amendment. Sorry. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So the amendment is before us. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. So to the bill as amended, any final word, Representative Cantrell? Uh, just wanted to thank you and the committee, Madam Chair. Um, I think that this bill will go a long way <coughs> to secure greater access to substance use disorder treatment in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and it uh, has been an absolute pleasure to testify before this uh, committee. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Representative Cantrell and Representative Mueller. And so House File 2231, as amended, is laid over for possible, possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, House File 1875, <coughs> Representative Wozniak. So the chair will move that House File 1875 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Welcome to the committee, Representative Wasilewick, and uh, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, chair Liebing and members of the committee, um, I'm pleased to introduce House File 1875 today, um, which would support a pilot project that the Center for Victims of Torture, or CVT, would conduct in partnership with the Department of Human Services. With me are Pete Dross, um, CVT's Director of External Relations, and Allison Beckman, a licensed clinical social worker and CVT's Senior Clinician for External Relations. We are fortunate here in Minnesota to be the home of CVT, um, the world's largest torture survivor rehabilitation program. It's an important international institution that for nearly 35 years has rebuilt the lives of Minnesotans who are here as refugees, asylum seekers, asylees, and permanent residents and who want nothing more than to overcome the legacy of torture and support themselves and their families. The legislation before you would expand um, a co-located co behavioral health program to three new sites in Minnesota. Um, it has three primary components. First, it would appropriate $1 million to CVT to support a two-year planning and implementation period in which CVT would establish three new project sites, likely St. Cloud, Minneapolis, and a city in southern Minnesota, probably Rochester. Second, it would establish uh, the adult mental health targeted case management reimbursement rate at $695 per client per month to be paid by DHS. And third, the legislation would appropriate $500,000 to CVT to work with DHS to determine if the tool that CVT has developed um, to measure social functioning can be adapted to work with a broader medical assistance population. Um, I thank the committee for your consideration and I'm going to turn it over to my testifier. All right, thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please just give your name and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Pete Dross, and I'm Director of External Relations at the Center for Victims of Torture. In the interest of time, I'll testify on our behalf, and my colleague, Allison Beckman, will answer any questions related to the study that forms the basis of this proposed legislation. Members uh, and Chair Liebling, uh, torture and severe war-related uh, traumas leave deep and long-lasting physical and psychological wounds that include chronic pain, balance and mobility problems, sleep disorders, anxiety, depression, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, frequent thoughts of suicide. Thousands of Minnesotans suffer from these symptoms, often leaving them unable to work, unable to care for themselves and their families, and unable to function independently in the world. CVT rebuilds the lives of these survivors. We work with the most severely affected, people who are highly symptomatic and unable to function, people who have serious and persistent mental illness and who are often at risk of inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. For the past, past five years, we've tested our model of care uh, against the care services available at two high quality primary care clinics that were our partners in this project. That's the Healtheast Roselawn <coughs> Clinic and the, excuse me, University of Minnesota Physicians uh, Bethesda uh, Bethesda Medicine Clinic. We conducted a randomized controlled trial, the most rigorous scientific study available. We measured four psychological symptom areas, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and somatic pain. We also measured six uh, domains of functionality, basic needs, stability, employment, social support, adjustment, and community engagement. Through a 37 question measurement tool we designed specifically for this purpose. We measured all these domains at intake and then at three, six, and 12 months. And in each of the four psychological symptom areas, and in each of the six functionality areas, the CVT intervention group posted superior results when compared to the control group. We've been able to show most of you privately the charts and graphs. Um, we, we, we're not able to do a handout because the data is now out for publication. But those of you who were able to review those, uh, those graphs saw that for the control group, there was very little change uh, over the course of the one year period. And for the CVT intervention group, the psychological symptom reductions were pronounced. And the improvements in functionality were equally pronounced. The differences were not only statistically significant uh, in every domain measured, but in research terms, most of the effect sizes were large or very large, meaning that the magnitude of the difference was large or very large. Now in this project, which again will establish three new uh, service project sites, each year we'll be able to help 156 highly affected individuals at risk of hospitalization, plus another four to 500 family members, because of course entire families are severely affected by mental health issues. And those are just the direct beneficiaries. As we know from our work at uh, Roselawn and Bethesda, hundreds of additional patients will benefit from this project uh, because the physicians tell us their work uh, is much more effective as a result of their engagement with us. We've also developed a 175 page toolkit for providers working with this population. It's uh, just now available for download for free, and in this project, we'll promote the use of this uh, toolkit statewide. And finally, uh, it's our sincere hope and belief uh, that working with the Department of Human Services, we can adapt the tool we developed to measure social functioning for a broader medical assistance population. Beneficiaries could include persons experiencing homelessness, veterans with PTSD, survivors of domestic abuse, and others. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to testify, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you or committee members might have. All right, well, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, are there questions from members? Representative Bierman. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Question for the testifiers. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the center, the CVT, started. Yes, it's, um, we were founded in 1985 um, here in Minnesota. It, uh, it actually was a, began as a conversation between uh, a father and a son. The father was uh, Governor Perpich, uh, and his son, Rudy Jr., was uh, a student at Stanford Law School who had gotten involved in an Amnesty International chapter. And uh, as we understand the story, he came home from uh, law school one uh, holiday season and said to his dad, so uh, you're the governor of the state. What are you going to do about human rights? And the governor uh, called some of his closest advisors uh, in the area of 
of human rights policy uh, and said, essentially, my son is after me to do something. Uh, what can we do? Uh, a task force was organized. A list of uh, options was presented to the governor. The most ambitious uh, option on the list uh, was the establishment of this rehabilitation center for torture victims, a place where survivors could come uh, and heal from those wounds. Uh, the governor embraced that concept. The founding task force uh, turned into a founding board of directors. Uh, and in the intervening 34 years, we have become, as Representative Waslowick noted, uh, the largest organization of our kind in the world. One, one more question. Just um, uh, you answered the question about, I was wondering about families being treated, and you said that they were. So the next question I had is, so it's the, one of the largest treatment centers in the world. I mean, what's the percentage of people that come in from out of state to be treated versus uh, Minnesota inhabitants? Um, Mr. Dross. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Bierman, that's, that's a great question. Um, at the time of the founding of CVT, it was thought, uh, and you, this would not be uh, unreasonable given that one of the members of the task force was, um, I think, the, the chair of the board of the Mayo Clinic, um, that this would be a destination uh, for torture survivors. People would come from around the world to this very specialized place. Um, but it was, it was soon understood uh, that there were thousands of torture survivors uh, living in Minnesota um, at the time. Uh, it, it's a very rare circumstance, and in fact almost never happens, um, that a survivor and his or her family or the survivor individually will come to Minnesota for these services. Uh, we, we believe there are probably 50,000 torture survivors living in the state right now. Representative Bierman. Thank, thank you for that. For that, uh, that um, that's just what I was wondering because I, I've met quite a few people from abroad that have been here and been through wars, and yeah. you know, it's just I know they've been through a lot, and uh, I thought there would be no lack of clients right here. There is no lack. All right, no. it's a great bill. Thank you for bringing it forward. All right, thank you. Other member questions, comments. Okay, I, I have a question, Mr. Dros. Why, um, when when I look at the bill and the, the rate is set out in the bill, and I wondered um, uh, on line one point one five, and I wonder how that rate is derived, and it's a and it's a bit unusual because it's a per member per month rate, which we don't see that too often. Could you just discuss that a little bit? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, we. Uh, we have a rate for adult mental health targeted case management that has been established uh, by Ramsey County um, as a host county contract for other counties that desire to uh, to bill or well that that desire desire to work with us for the provision of these services for residents of their counties. So, in addition to Ramsey, uh, we have these concurrence agreements with uh, Hennepin, Anoka. Dakota and Washington. That rate was established in 2010 at $530 per client per month. We're in a conversation now with Ramsey County about adjusting that rate to, to uh, reflect uh, uh, the impact of inflation and inflationary and, and salary increases for our staff at the rate of 3% per year that we've granted since 2010. So the rate of 695 per month is really an inflation adjusted uh, rate that was set by Ramsey County as it determined our actual costs for providing these services. Okay, and then could you just give us an idea of uh, what kinds of practitioners are actually providing the service? Sure, Madam Chair. Yeah. So for Welcome the target committee, and please say your name for yes. the record. Yes, Madam Chair and um, committee, my name is Allison Beckman. I'm the senior clinician for external relations at the Center for Victims of Torture. So this project would um, 
would include two main types of providers, psychotherapists, which are licensed professionals. Our psychotherapists are currently either clinical social workers, so LICSWs, or PhD um, or LP psychologists. The adult mental health targeted case management social workers that we uh, employ are all either LGSW, so licensed um, graduate social workers, or um, LICSWs, which is also a clinical social worker, so master level clinicians um, at least. Thank you. And then, you know, as um, if this is to be a replicable program, is it thought that um, that this would have to well, the practitioners you just described are very high level practitioners, mm -hmm. and I can imagine that that's been, you know, these are very traumatized people that you deal with, and I can imagine in, in a lot of ways I, I would say that if you're dealing with victims of torture, when we talk a lot about trauma around here, mm -hmm. and that is trauma. And so you have a very highly, uh, highly specialized and highly um, educated workforce. And is it, is it your thinking that if this program was to be broadened and to be, um, that the findings were to be uh, replicable, that we would need to keep that high level of practitioner? Or is this something that eventually might be able to be uh, available more broadly with, because I, I can, uh, I don't know the numbers, but I, I think we, we don't have, mm -hmm. you know, large numbers of, of practitioners at that level. Can you address that? Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, that's a that's a, a wonderful question. And as we move out state into places that may have overall uh, smaller numbers of practitioners in general, it will be an interesting thing that we'll have to factor into our modeling. Um, we are uh, particularly interested in hiring individuals from affected communities and helping to support them to get through those master's programs and get that high level of education. And we've we've already done that with a couple of our staff. Staff, so that might be a model that we would be looking to. Okay. Any other member questions? All right. Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. House File 1870. Oh, I should ask if anyone else in the room wants to testify on the bill. House File 1875. And seeing none, um, House File 1875 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Finance Omnibus Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. House file 1516, Representative Acom. You thought you would never come. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure of the order. Well, we're, it's a little bit ad hoc, I have to say. All right, welcome to the committee. And Representative Acom moves that House file. 1516 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health and Human Services Finance Omnibus Bill. And let's see, we don't have an amendment in the packet, so I think Representative Aikum, please go ahead and present the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, House File 1516 was brought to me by the Minnesota Home Care Association on behalf of a coalition of provider, providers, advocates, and the Minnesota Department of Health. Over the years, individuals involved with home care licensing have identified areas um, of the licensing statute that are unclear, unworkable, or outdated. This legislation is aimed at addressing these specific areas in need of updating or increased clarity. Um, the bill was referred to this committee to um, take a look at the um, financial implications. And um, so I have Kevin Goodnow who can um, talk to that. We ha it's been through um, HHS policy and where did we start? Government operations. And government, government operations, yeah. looks like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I wasn't, I was so not ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I apologize, Madam yeah, Chair. It's quite all right. All right, Mr. Goodno, welcome to the committee. Uh, Ms. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Kevin Goodno, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Home Care Association representing them today. Um, I believe it was noted, at least to me, that the one of the reasons why the bill came to this committee was to look yeah. at the fee on lines 5.7 and 5.8. And um, the bill does put in a new fee of $1,000 for people, or actually agencies, who are have a temporary license. Uh, and if they 
the, under the requirement of their temporary license, if they, when they start to serve people, they're required to, within five days of actually serving an individual once they're licensed, they need to notify the Department of Health. Uh, this would be considered a late fee in the sense that if they do not comply with that requirement, uh, there would be a $1,000 fee um, placed on them at that point. I know last year when we, um, when we looked at this bill and proposed this, the Department of Health came back with no fiscal cost related to this because they didn't, it was too speculative and they couldn't determine if they could collect a fee or not. I know people from the Department of Health are here and they can speak to that issue. And I don't know if you have any other questions beyond that, but other than that, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. All right, so I wonder if the department could come down and give us some information. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Jonathan Hill, and I'm a registered nurse and a health resource supervisor for the Home Care and Assisted Living Program. Okay, well, Mr. Hill, thank you for coming down. So um, I think that the question was, I don't think we have a, a fiscal note for this bill, but uh, I guess the question would be if you could discuss the fees and whether there's any impact to the department, fiscal impact. It, it is my understanding that um, this fee will not impact the department as it will be a great deterrent because of the amount of the fee. And so there will be no impact. Okay. okay. So, um, Representative Acom, it's my understanding that um, the bill is uh, on the floor in the Senate. So did you prefer to have the bill move separately and go to the floor? It, it, it doesn't matter, I don't think. It, yeah, if that's, you can handle it that way or it can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, Representative Loeffler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, as we are looking at this and remembering what we did ye yesterday in House File 90, I had actually sent a, a text to, to Representative Schultz that just it's easier if we have consistency across uh, programs and this addresses many of the same issues and we should maybe look at whether or not there's, they're parallel in construction or not. Um, and where there are differences, that's, that it's justifiable. Okay, Representative Schultz. Did you want to add to that? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, we might want to roll it into another bill rather than going to the floor alone so we don't run into problems as we modify our, our underlying bill, House File 90. So. Oh, okay. And, and I think that might have been also one of the reasons that, that it came here was not only the fiscal piece but because of that concern. So I think so. I think that we're gonna, um, you know, lay it over and, um, you know, um, and also I'm understanding that it's this is a little different version than what the Senate has as well. Am I correct in that, Mr. Goodenough? Madam Chair, members of the committee, the uh, difference is that there were two sections taken out of this bill and some modifications related to the use of the word plan and agreement. Uh, in the bill, and that was done in the policy committee in, this, in the House. Um, that was done after the bill had already made it to the floor in the Senate, so we weren't able to modify it on the Senate floor. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Well, um, are there any? And is there anyone else who wants to testify on House File 1516? Okay. I'm not seeing anybody. So um, I think, given the the um, Discussion. Is there any further discussion from members? Representative Acom, any final word? I think what I'm thinking is that perhaps what we'll do is, roll, is uh, lay it over for possible inclusion. And that'll be just fine, Madam Chair. Appreciate okay. the. Uh, All right, so Representative Acom, do you have any final words on the bill? No, I just appreciate the consideration and thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um, so um, with that then, um, House File 1516 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus <laughs> Bill. Thank you. Yeah, 
Shall we take 1378? Okay. 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 We will take up House Bill 572, Representative Schultz. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Representative Schultz moves House File 572 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. And uh, there's an amendment. Um, Representative Schultz, did you want to move that now? Uh, sure. Is that, uh, do you want to? Um, okay, so to put the bill in the file in which you'd like to discuss in the shape in which you'd like to discuss it? Yes, please. All right, so Representative Schultz moves the A6 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. Please uh, discuss the bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. So House File 572 establishes medical loss ratios for our, our health plans being sold in Minnesota of 80% and um, to make sure that Plans are spending at least 80% of their premium on health care claims, um, and it requires a retrospective review by the commission by the Department of Commerce. And the, the amendment is the um, HMO conversion bill that we've heard in many committees already this session. Um, and I have a testifier to go through um, the details of that conversion. Uh, language with the committee. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is uh, Ben Velzen. I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office and Manager of the Office's Charities Division. Um, I know we've already heard uh, uh, many bills today and I think there's a few more on the schedule, so I'll be very brief and have a uh, provide a high-level overview of conversions and uh, mm -hmm. the A6 amendment, and of course, would be happy to uh, take any questions on um, any of those. So I'm, of course, testifying on behalf of the Attorney General's Office. Attorney General Keith Ellison is committed to protecting the public's interest and supports this bill as a way to better protect Minnesota taxpayers when charitable assets are being held for their benefit and transferred from HMOs to for-profit companies. So a quick 30-second uh, primer on conversions. Um, from 1973 until 2017, all Minnesota HMOs were nonprofit organizations. The law was changed in 2017 to allow HMOs to be for-profits. Um, during the years that HMOs were nonprofits in Minnesota, they uh, of course received numerous tax exemptions from Minnesota taxpayers, which are effectively subsidies. Um, they received billions in revenue from managing uh, the state's managed care contracts. Those uh, contracts are worth $21 billion in revenue from 2002 to 2011, $5 billion in 2015 alone. And this has resulted in Minnesota's nonprofit HMOs uh, accumulating substantial charitable assets. As of the year end 2017, they had about $6.4 billion in charitable assets. And so the question is, uh, what happens now that HMOs can be for-profits, what happens if they want to quote-unquote convert to a for-profit company? And all a conversion is is merely the switch in the status from a non-profit to a for-profit. So the question is, if, if Minnesota's HMOs decide they want to try to accomplish that, what happens to those $6.4 billion in charitable assets? Do they go to pad the bottom line of the new for-profit company, or are they protected and preserved uh, for the benefit of the public interest and the benefit of Minnesota taxpayers and residents. Uh, what the A6 amendment to HF 572 does is in essence put in place prior AG review of significant uh, conversion transactions where a nonprofit HMO is attempting to convert to a for-profit. Um, most conversions are uh, uh, effectuated through asset transfer, so the simple transfer of assets from the nonprofit to the for-profit. If those asset transfers are sufficiently large enough, HF 572 requires prior AG review of it under numerous factors laid out in the bill um, to ensure it's in the public interest. Um, 
if an HMO also attempts to transfer assets out of state, uh, it requires a prior AG review if uh, the asset transfer is large enough. So that's the essence of the bill, which is uh, to just to protect charitable assets that these HMOs have accumulated over the last four decades and make sure they remain held for the benefit of the Minnesota public. Um, real quickly on the fiscal implications of the A6 amendment. Um, when an HMO converts, there uh, are often lots of co costs associated with it, valuation experts, uh, staff time, things like that. But there is actually cost recoupment language in this bill, so it would allow the AG to recoup the costs of uh, its review of these transactions so the net impact uh, is zero. So with that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, is there anyone else who wants to testify on House File 572? We think we could do that. Okay. Um, so, uh, are there questions from members? Representative Haley. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wondering if you can clarify these the ratios, the 80 percent, 85 percent, how those were arrived upon, and and if what that's based on, upon, um, and also the different ratios for individual and small employers. I think that's what exists today in statute, but do I understand this right that now both um, the individual market, the small market, the large market, every everybody in the insurance market is gonna be held to the same ratios. Can you uh, clarify that for me? Sure. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Haley, so um, the Department of Commerce helped me draft the language and um, um, thought these ratios um, were the relevant ratios to use. And um, we've been using them at the, at the federal level as part of the ACA um, until a recent change. We have even um, higher ratios, 90% for those in our public programs. Um, so I think these are the ratios um, that still provide uh, a percentage of profit and administrative overhead by the health plans. And um, I do have a fiscal note, Madam Chair, for for this part of House File 572. Um, the cost is going to be in 2020, $29,000. In 2021, 57, um, or $28,000 for so for the biennium, for the first biennium, biennium it's $57,000, and for the second, it's $56,000. And um, given what's happening, um, many plans, this was just in the article in the business section of the Star Tribune, United Health Group had to rebate employers $146 million. We've had other rebates in our own state from other of our plans because their premiums um, were much higher than they needed to be to, to pay for the medical claims. Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. One follow-up. Um, can you... Uh, again, just to help me understand this better, on the um, reporting requirements, it, we have reporting requirements under federal law, correct? And does the, does your proposal at, just align the reporting with federal law, or you are instituting new state reporting for the Representative Schultz? Thank you, Madam Chair. So there's new rules being considered to change the federal requirements dropping them to 70%, and which I think is much too low. So I think we need our own state standards um, uh, of 80 or 85% of medical loss ratio to make sure that people's premium dollars are going to pay medical claims. Right, right now, um, Madam Chair, Representative Haley, currently it's prospective analysis by the Con Department of Commerce instead of retrospective. So this bill would make it retrospective to see if they're, what they're actually paying out um, in medical claims. Thank you. So, Representative Schultz, um, <laughs> my understanding is that uh, the idea of loss ratios, medical loss ratios for health insurers, um, actually predates the Affordable Care Act in Minnesota. We had them for a long time. Um, I, I remember uh, actually uh, some attempts to repeal them before the Affordable Care Act. And so, um, our, could you just explain? Um, do we not have now have our own, or are you ch changing them? I'm just not exactly sure. Did we repeal those when the ACA came in, or you know what's going on? Sure. So, Madam Chair, so in our uh, plans that are in our on the HMO public program side, we have our own, and we've had our own. Those were not repealed, and I think those are higher. I believe they're at ninety percent on the. Um, 
outside of the public program market. We have ratios at the Department of Commerce, but they use they they're prospective, meaning that the plans provide um, an estimate of what they think they're going to spend out of their premium on medical claims. So this makes it retrospective to make sure um, we're doing our, our our job and have oversight and accountability to those plans that those dollars are actually being spent on medical care. Great, thank you very much for that explanation. Representative Cantrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Schultz, for uh, bringing this bill forward. I just wanted to say that I think it is an absolutely brilliant bill to make sure that um, as we wade into this landscape of uh, for-profit HMOs in the state of Minnesota, that we are preserving, um, especially for our most vulnerable Minnesotans, the, the quality of care and the idea that money in health care should be spent primarily on care and not on overhead costs. And that's really what I think this bill seeks to do, if that's an accurate characterization. Is it? Um, yes. Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Cantrell. Yes, we're trying. This is one way to make sure that um, our dollars are being used appropriately. Oh, There's fantastic, Madam <laughs> Chair and Representative Schultz. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for your work. All right. Um, so are there other questions from members? All right, seeing none. I have one. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Fierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to following back on um, we, when you mentioned the $6.4 billion in assets that are being reviewed or held now, are they just sort of in limbo with the company and awaiting a decision on that? Or can they just sit on that until um, forever? Mr. Belson. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, those $6.4 in assets that I referred to are, is the current assets that uh, Minnesota's major HMOs hold um, from their financial statements. So none have uh, are currently seeking to attempt to convert. Uh, I was just pointing out that if they were uh, inclined to in the future at some point in time, uh, $6.4 billion in charitable assets are implicated by any efforts to convert. And one more question. So now in there, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, thank you. In their new structure as a for-profit, does that, that's just reported every year and added to it. So it's just a continuing tab for them. Mr. Belson. Madam Chair, Representative, um, if an HMO were a nonprofit HMO were to convert, uh, essentially what would happen is is their assets would be transferred to the for-profit HMO, and under the bill, um, the value of those assets would be used to establish a new uh, nonprofit foundation to continue to promote public health. That's how the value of the assets that are transferred to the new for-profit would be retained. Um, in, in, a, in the nonprofit world, if you will, and continued to use for their nonprofit purposes of promoting public health in Minnesota. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, Mr. Fels and I have a question. So um, discussion has been had about different kinds of conversions, I guess. You've got the, I think what your bill here, what Representative Schultz's bill here is dealing with is where a nonprofit would convert to a for-profit. Does it also do something about um, Nonprofits that um, uh, send their assets to another nonprofit uh, holding company, say, which can then send them to a for profit. Is that covered by what you've got here, Mr. Belson? M Madam Chair, a um, couple quick points on that. Um, sig uh, significant asset transfers out of state um, would now require prior AG review and approval under this bill. Um, there is another portion of this bill, which I think colloquially everyone is referring to as the net earnings portion of the bill, that um, rolls partially rolls back the January 2017 law um, and basically would now require nonprofit HMOs to reinvest their net earnings back into their charitable mission um, by inserting some additional language into the statute to that effect that was struck out in January 2017. So, Mr. Velzen, um I think the language you're referring to is language that I am reinstating in another bill. So does this bill contain that language as well, or, or does it replace that language or make that language unnecessary? Let me flip through here, Madam Chair. An earlier version of 533 did, and an earlier version of 572 did. 
And actually, I didn't see it in my flip through, so perhaps this version does not. So, so um, staff just told me it is in the current version of 572. I'm section, looking at the amendment. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Section four. Okay, it's online, starting on line 3.22 of the uh, of the base bill, and then we've added the amendment to that. So that is that language is in there as well. Okay. Very good. Okay. So are, are there any further questions from other members? All right. Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, House File 572, is, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. All right. Representative Schultz, if you want to just stay there sure. for a few minutes. And House File 197. Do you have a copy of it up there? Let me grab it from my desk. So Representative Schultz moves that House File 197 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. So Representative Schultz, please present 197. So House File 197, thank you, Madam Chair and members, it would impose a premium tax on for-profit health maintenance organizations at the rate of 2%. The nonprofit HMOs would continue to be taxed at the current rate of 1%. So this is gearing up to um, um, gear up for the for-profit HMOs that may be entering our Minnesota market. Okay, are there any other testifiers that you have on this bill, Representative Schultz? I don't. I, I don't have a. Uh, there's one listed here. I have Deborah Wilbright on my oh, page. Oh yes, is Deborah Wilbright here? Okay. <laughs> Deborah Wilbright. Okay, I don't think she's here. So, is there anyone else who wants to testify on House File 197? Okay, not seeing anyone. So, um, so Representative Schultz, as I'm understanding this um, this bill, this is um, kind of uh, so since when the legislation was passed that allowed for-profit HMOs. It was done, I would say, kind of quick and dirty. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a cleanup to that, one could call it, in case, in case we uh, actually do have HMOs here that are for profit, that they should pay the same kinds of taxes as we um, are currently requiring from our nonprofits. Is that kind of accurate? Currently, but it's at this, Madam Chair, this is at a 2% rate yeah. rather than a 1% rate. Okay. And, um, Yes, it didn't, wasn't cur currently in statute for profit HMO, so we had to um, put that in state statute, and this revenue will go to the health care access fund. Okay, very good. Um, so, uh, any other member questions? Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative uh, Gruhagen sent me this question to ask you. Uh, in <laughs> How long is it? Is it a book? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I thought that the committee would be done because uh, Gigi and I were gone for a couple hours, but uh, uh, right. we uh, covered a lot of ground. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> but my, my question just is simply: How does this how does this lower the cost of health care? Because it seems like it's just going to be uh, you know it's a hundred percent tax increase on on this tax that consumers are paying on their premiums. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, nonpartisan House Research may want to jump in. And correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the, the these HMOs are paying a premium tax instead of an other tax a, a corporation would pay. So I I think maybe does anyone want to jump in and correct me? No, I think I saw. <coughs> I thought Ms. Dalton come in the room. Is she here? Okay. I guess you'll just have to take my word for it. <laughs> I'm on the tax committee. I, I think this that is correct. So um, it's a it's a it's a premium tax 
um, that um, other corporations face taxes as well. But uh, how does it affect healthcare costs? Uh, I think that's a, a time for a different debate, not to, not today in this committee. But, yeah. All right, Representative Monson. Yeah, and I, I, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest with with people when when I when I see stuff that isn't you know in the political debate that isn't necessarily honest, like I did on the floor. And this, th I mean. Most people are going to see that there's already a, a one percent premium being paid as a tax, and it's kind of the consumer kind of ends up paying this in their premiums, and now we're just looks like we're doubling it. And I just want to get a an honest answer on how this doesn't just increase directly increase the cost of health care for consumers. Um, and I and I know that mm -hmm. it's frustrating to me that there's nonprofits that there's no caps on how many how much executives can get paid on nonprofits nonprofits can be very profitable for the people that are running those organizations so um, the difference between profit and nonprofit you know it's mm -hmm. it's not as big not as big a difference as a lot of people make it up to be but this increase in tax is is significant and I it, we can maybe wait for the tax people to come back at, at a later time at the end of your testimony but uh, it's concerning to me that you're doubling the tax so, yeah, Madam Chair, so I agree that for profits and nonprofits, um, they're very similar. Uh, but nonprofits do provide um, a, a mission and community benefits um, for their tax status that for profits are, do not need to do. So there is there's some differences there, and um, um, but I don't I don't agree that we should just not not have any tax because uh, there, there are benefits to having tax revenue, provide benefits for people who are low income, can't, provide, can't purchase health insurance, um, and that benefits a lot of our health care providers and hospitals um, by reducing uncompensated care. And um, so Munson. is a follow-up. So if, if a for-profit HMO is delivering health care, they, they would still be subject to corporate tax, it's not like they don't pay any income tax and they only pay a provider tax, is that what I'm hearing? They, they pay normal taxes like any other for-profit. Madam Chair, the premium no. tax, I think they're treated a little bit differently in our tax code than other corporations. And I, I'm gonna, I'll get you that information if no one is here tonight um, and follow up with the committee and get you the specific uh, tax code that, that they fall under and how they're treated differently. But it's not a provider tax, it's, it's a premium tax. Right, thank you, Representative Schultz. And this is, an, and again, this isn't increasing a tax that already exists. This is on an entity that right now doesn't, is this, uh, we, is this on for-profit? Yeah, Madam Chair, this would be new tax revenue since we'd have, we don't have any for-profit HMOs currently operating in the state. Right. Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Schultz. If your intent is uh, to make sure that we have a premium tax to help pay for health care, uh, would you be open to an amendment that would make sure that any additional taxes collected under your bill would be dedicated funds in the health care access fund to do that? Because we all know the health care access fund gets rated, and even in the governor's current proposal, money gets redirected to the general fund. I am really open to amendments that uh, solidifies the health care access fund so that's not rated for non-health care purposes. <laughs> Representative, yeah, and Representative Haley, I, that sounds like a really interesting idea. It would make a nice bill. I don't know well, if it would make To clarify, Madam a, Chair, I'm, I'm actually opposed to this bill, but it, <laughs> it's just to clarify the, the direction you want to head, and then we're putting it into a fund that ends up in the general fund anyway and doesn't actually help health care. So um, I just wanted to call that out. Well, Representative Haley, if you're saying that the health care access fund ends up in the general fund anyway and doesn't help, help health care, I mean, money is money, right? You spend a dollar out of one fund and out of another, and it's still a dollar. However, I think we've heard a lot of testimony that the health care access fund, you know, while uh, you know, all of us probably at one time or another has had a complaint about the way it's been used uh, by somebody other than us. Um, it, uh, it provides a lot of health care for Minnesotans and provides a lot of public health uh, benefit to all Minnesotans. So 
I, I don't think it's really accurate to say that the, that the fund isn't used for health care or uh, to imply that most of it isn't or even, I mean, you know, I can't, I can't uh, swear that every dollar goes for health care, but certainly um, a lot of, of it does. We know that $800 million um, to pay for health care for Minnesotans. Okay, um, are there other? Um, okay, well, yeah, there was, um, I think we're trying to get uh, someone from taxes, from, from house research and taxes. I mean, do members want to lay this over and wait? I think we probably have exhausted this discussion and we can probably move on, but um, maybe we can get a question, an answer to the question. Aha, uh -huh. wait a minute. <laughs> Okay, uh -huh. just in no. time. I, I don't know. So. <coughs> okay, so I guess we, I hope we, we have someone who I think can answer the question. So the question and is, um, Senator Schultz. The, the question is to House Research, the 2% premium tax on health maintenance organizations, are they treated differently than other corporations? For that tax, um, are they not paying other taxes because they're paying a premium tax? And uh, House Research, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Chris Clayman from House Research. Okay, Mr. Clayman, if you can answer. Uh, Madam Chair, to, to uh, Representative Schultz's question, uh, insurance companies are exempt from the corporate franchise tax and instead they pay the premiums tax. And depending on the type of insurance company that you are, you'll either pay 2% or you could pay a, a lower amount if you're a, a different type of insurance company. So they wouldn't be subject to the corporate franchise tax. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I think that kind of- So I was kind of sort of validated. We should have taken a bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I could see where the, the hour is late and we're all getting a little punchy. All right, so with that house file, do you have any final words, Representative Schultz? Um, no, I do not. Okay. With that, House File 197 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to take up 1378. <laughs> Madam Chair, would you like to move your bill? Yes. <laughs> She's not messing around working at this time. Yes. I know. <coughs> I know. We're, we can walk and move bills. <laughs> Are we ready to vote? I get a laugh every time I make that joke. <laughs> So, uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move that House File 1378 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Okay. Okay. Um, so, staying on the theme of HMOs and nonprofits and for profits, this bill does a couple of things that everybody's kind of familiar with after the discussion today. Um, so this bill takes us back to having only nonprofit HMOs in the state of Minnesota. Um, and about that, I just would say that when this was passed in, I think in uh, 2017, it really happened without very much discussion. There wasn't any real, as far as I'm aware, there wasn't a lot of analysis. I mean, I think that there's an idea out there that somehow injecting more companies into our um, insurance space will uh, promote competition and drive down prices and all those kind of good things. But I don't know that there was any analysis of that. And I think we, uh, the state rushed into that 
um, without really much consideration. So this bill is one that proposes that we go back to having only nonprofit status for HMOs in the state of Minnesota. The other thing that it does, uh, this was discussed in one of Representative Schultz's bills, if you want to look at line 3.3 to 3.11, there's the net earnings language. And just to kind of um, uh, be very clear about this, so when the, um, in 2017, I believe, when the governor's, uh, Governor Dayton's premium discount plan was passed. If you remember, we did a 25% premium discount for uh, folks who had, uh, who were buying their insurance in the individual market. This piece of language was repealed in that bill. And it was repealed without any discussion. It was just a one line repealer. Um, there was a lot going on, but this was never discussed that I recalled. And so when you look at this, however, it, this is language that I subsequently learned has had been in Minnesota law for about 25 years. And the, the uh, thrust of this language is to require that nonprofit health maintenance organizations had to use their money for the nonprofit purposes of health care. So if you're a nonprofit and you're not using your funds that you make, your net earnings. If you were a for-profit, we'd call it profits. When you're a nonprofit, we call it net earnings. But there is a reason that a nonprofit is a nonprofit. It's supposed to be mission-driven. And if you're an HMO in Minnesota and you have nonprofit status that brings you big tax benefits, then I think that it is totally reasonable for the state to require you to use your nonprofit earnings, your net earnings, for the nonprofit purposes of the health maintenance organization in providing comprehensive health care. And that is the heart of this little paragraph. Um, it was a simple little thing. Nobody really, I think, paid much attention to it um, when it was there for so many years, kind of quietly doing its job. But when it went away, without much discussion, we um, started to see our nonprofit HMOs shifting some money around out of their net assets. And um, this has become a problem. This is the, one of the problems that Representative Schultz's bill was trying, is trying to address. And so um, what I'm doing here is putting this language back. Now, this language has been amended from what it originally was because it didn't used to say nonprofit HMOs, health and maintenance organizations because it didn't have to, because they were all nonprofits. So I have inserted the word nonprofit into this so that this clearly refers only to nonprofit health maintenance organizations. So um, that's what this is doing. Um, and then the section eight that's here was a, an amendment that was inserted in the Commerce Committee. Um, and uh, frankly, I don't know if this will survive because it really kind of doesn't make a lot of sense in the context of the bill, I think. Because I think that the, I think that the, what the amendment, the, what the Section 8 is calling for, is making some determinations that should have been made when we made the change in the first place. And really should be made, but should be made going the other way. So Minnesota's had only nonprofit health insurers for many, many years. I don't know how many, but it's at least 25 or so. And then to make a change, we should, have, we should have made these determinations and waited for the data before we did. So the bill goes back to what we had before. And uh, so that is, that is 1378. Thank you, Chair Liebling. Um, testifiers, Ethan. No testifiers, Madam Chair. No. There's a couple people on the list. Uh -huh. Mr. Ethan Vogel. Please introduce yourself for the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Ethan Vogel. I'm a legislative representative with AFSCME Council 5. Uh, AFSCME is a public and private sector labor union, and we represent over 43,000 workers in Minnesota. Many of them help provide the safety net services that our most vulnerable um, Minnesotans depend on. Our mission at AFSCME is to advocate for excellence in services for the public, dignity in the workplace and opportunity and prosperity for all workers. 
Um, ensuring excellent services over the long term requires responsible budgeting practices and policies which uh, strengthen public trust in government. And I'm here to support um, House File 1378 because this bill will help strengthen public trust as we continue to invest public dollars in our public health programs. Minnesotans want and expect their public health investments to be dedicated to promoting comprehensive health care, not used to benefit shareholders of for-profit companies. Please support House File 1378. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. I have a couple members with questions. I do have another testifier on the list. Did you want to ask your questions now or wait? Okay. Uh, the next testifier, Mr. Bob Robbins. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Bob Robbins. I'm a healthcare leader at uh, Take Action Minnesota, from, and I'm from Invergrove Heights. I'm here to testify in support of HF 1378. In Minnesota, we believe in fairness and the common good. That's why until 2017, we banned for-profit companies from selling health insurance. The ban is lifted this year. Take Action Minnesota opposed the decision to allow for-profit HMOs to operate in Minnesota. Allowing them is a leap in the wrong direction. While we are dissatisfied with the use of HMOs as a vehicle to provide health care, nonprofit plans have a responsibility to benefit the public and are subject to oversight. United Health Group, on the other hand, is a global 100 company. It's accountable by law to its shareholders, not patients. UHG has already obtained an HMO license in Minnesota this year. <clears throat> there is no need and no place for a bad actor like United Health Group in our state programs. UHG and its subsidiaries have been cited numerous times for fraud. This month, a judge ruled that United Health Group's subsidiary breached its fiduciary duty by adopting coverage guidelines that did not reflect general standards of care. The judge called the coverage guidelines fundamentally flawed and tainted by financial interests. The Star Tribune also recently reported that UHG was being investigated by the U.S. House for selling short-term junk policies and discriminate, that discriminate against individuals with pre-existing conditions and puts consumers at significant financial risk. The bottom line is that for-profit health insurance companies exist to enrich themselves. Minnesota should be working toward a people-centered health care system like One Care Buy-In. We urge you to support HF 1378. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Robbins. You. I am equally dissatisfied with our use of HMOs. I appreciate your testimony. <laughs> um, anybody in the audience like to testify? Uh, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Liebling. We have a letter here from the Council of Health Plans that talks about how this um, has the effect of putting the nonprofits at a competitive disadvantage towards the for profits. And I've Assuming that's not your objective overall in, in all of this, but uh, know that if the, the actions of the bills will have uh, consequences like that. I'm just wondering how you uh, make sense of that, and, and uh, um, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Schumacher. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. And I don't have that in front of me, but um, I, uh, I, you know, they, they, oh, thank you. Oh, and maybe I do have it in front of me. I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> Um, so um, I had heard the testimony before in a previous committee to this effect. I think that the issue, as Ms. Commit testified to it, was the amendment, in fact, that was added. Um, first of all, uh, so she read this as saying, since the amendment, this Section 8, delays the exit of... Um, it would delay the exit of for-profits. So this would leave for-profits operating in Minnesota. At the same time, the nonprofits would be under the Section 5 of the bill, which is the net earnings restriction. I think that is what was the, um, the problem that they were concerned about. And since I had added the word nonprofit to Section um, 5 of the bill, requiring 
the, um, the this is the all net earnings of the nonprofit health maintenance organization <laughs> shall be devoted to the nonprofit purposes of the health maintenance organization in providing comprehensive health care. So apparently they thought, well, that in fact, she had said to me, um, this should be applied to for profits as well. And to that I say, no, because for profits are there to make profit. That is what they do. That is the purpose of a for profit company is to make profit for whomever owns a company, whether it's an individual or shareholder. So it, it would make no sense to say that the, all of their net earnings had to be for, for the purpose of providing health care. So I, I don't think that their level playing field argument makes a lot of sense. Obviously, the bill is really intended to go back to the situation before where we would have only nonprofits and there would be a level playing field. Any possible unlevel playing field in the, within this bill is created by that amendment that was added. So, you know, that, I, I just actually, I find it a little um, interesting that nonprofit organizations would um, think that for-profits should be treated the same way as they. You know, I think we had this conversation actually in another committee. You know, um, there are great benefits in being a nonprofit. And they are supposed to be mission driven and serve a public interest. And that is why they get a great gift from the, from the taxpayer of having exemption from taxes that for profits are supposed to pay. So in return for that, they have obligations that, non, that for profits don't. And uh, to the degree that that gives, they think that's an unlevel playing field, I say that is an unlevel playing field that is created in our laws and needs to stay there. Representative Schumacher. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, I guess on the similar lines of what Representative Schumacher had said, I'm uh, your your provision about requiring the net earnings be directed towards their charitable cause or the purpose of delivering care. Um, I mean, as a nonprofit, all of your net earnings could actually just be divided up and given to bonuses of the management and executives of the company. And that would still be allowed under your provision, right? You're just, you're just, this, this would change any holdovers after salaries and bonuses are paid. Chair so. Lubing? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Munson, for that question. This isn't solving every problem. I grant you that. This is just putting back a piece of language that was there for 25 years that really, I think, prevented um, these these uh, HMOs from transferring their assets to other unrelated things. The problem of, of nonprofit companies being kind of off mission and a little bit out of control is also sometimes a problem. I grant you that. And in fact, I personally have done work in our, um, in fact, I and Michelle Benson in a previous um, legislative session did work to rein in some of what the HMOs spend their money on and then charge back to us as providers of Medicaid. So I am not, I am not under the illusion that being a nonprofit means that you're wonderful and mission driven and everything's just terrific. But I think that just to remove this language and then allow uh, nonprofits to use their money for other kinds of things, um, and without this restriction is, was just uh, very ill-conceived. I also haven't been able to find out who removed it. Nobody will fess up that they asked for this to be removed. So I, I really do not even know who was seeking this change. And the Council of Health Plans has said it wasn't them. I think Medica said it wasn't them. Everybody's saying, it wasn't us. So let's put it back. Okay. In Representative Munson. <clears throat> So I, I guess overall, I'm just concerned that as for-profits are able to operate in Minnesota, that it appears that we are now burdening nonprofits with with more regulation and perhaps removing their last significant justification for being nonprofit, and they would maybe convert to for-profit if you're restricting some of the things that the the nonprofits can do with their with the money within the organization. Chair Liebling. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Munson. What you said I just really confuses me because you, I think you contradicted yourself. You're really concerned about them paying too much to CEOs and all of these things. And then on the other hand, 
You don't want them to have to use their money for nonprofit purposes, for the purpose for which they are an organization and have promised that that is their mission. I don't get that. But we're not imposing new regulation on them. They had this regulation for 25 years, and it was removed for no apparent reason that nobody can explain. I mean, if there was a justification, what is it? That's why I put this bill together. What is the justification? I brought it through all these committees and members. Maybe it was a member who's now gone. I don't know. But nobody will, nobody will uh, fess up to even knowing about this thing. So, I mean, I know you probably, you, may, maybe you were here. I don't remember if you would have been even been here for that. But, you know, we're not putting regulation on them. We're asking them, if you're a nonprofit, act like one. That's all. Representative Halverson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Chair Liebling, you know um, very well that I am, uh, I think that nonprofit health care is incredibly important to Minnesota, and I remember wars that we had um, several years ago when um, allowing for-profit hospital systems to function in the state was, was a debate, and, and um, that went forward, and um, when we have companies, and we, we're kind of experiencing this with uh, the pharmaceutical debates that we're having. We have companies who have a fiduciary responsibility to deliver um, to shareholders. Um, that's a different motivation. And um, if your uh, uh, motivation is uh, putting your shareholders first, or if your fiduciary responsibility is to put your shareholders first, that, that's a real problem. Um, the other thing that we know is, is that in Minnesota, our nonprofit health care, the dollars really do go to health care. And, and as, as has been stated, Minnesota pioneered, um, you know, nonprofit HMOs, and, and that was a, a, a nation leader for in Minnesota. Um, and it made Minnesota, um, it made sure that the care that we get is provided by the people in our state. Um, so people are employed in our state. Um, if you call... Um, a, a, a local health plan, nonprofit health plan, you're talking to somebody in Minnesota um, and you're um, talking to um, people I, I, who can pronounce St. Croix when I used to live on St. Croix Trail and I, I, you could always tell when people weren't from Minnesota <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were calling into a call center. Um, and so I think that that's, that's really important and a lot of these folks who work at, at these local nonprofit companies uh, live in our district. And what we found um, in other states that have had these great expansions of for-profit health care, and Minnesota actually had this happen when um, Medicare Part D got passed, um, we had for-profits from out of state who'd kind of left Minnesota alone. We were kind of, the cheese stands alone. We were doing our thing and delivering care to more people um, uh, than, than any other state um, in terms of percentage of uninsured. Um, but when uh, Medicare Part D passed and there was a whole new um, bank of business to try to get, the for-profits did swoop in because that was federal law and we didn't um, have jurisdiction over that at the state level. They swooped in and they, uh, with loss leader plans to see how much money they can make. And here's the rub, folks. We got about 5 million people in Minnesota, about 500 um, million, or excuse me, about 5 million covered lives. In order to make a profit, you need a big share of the market. So you come in, you gobble up as much market share as you can, um, elbow out the competition, um, make sure that there's consolidation, or make sure that our local companies go out of business. And then... Um, and then you get to raise your prices, you get to, um, you have a lot more power. And so um, that's the real risk to Minnesotans. And, and, and now because of, of this change in law, um, which I don't attribute to anybody uh, at the, the nonprofit health plans, and I know that they've testified to that, um, we're really at risk of that, and other states have seen that. And um, other state, and then the worst is when they don't deliver for their shareholders. Guess what happens? They pack up and move out. They're not invested in our state, and so we want to be sure that that we are incentivizing folks to invest in our state. And um, I want to make it clear that um, nonprofit health plans in Minnesota pay taxes, um, and uh, we can get um, data on that. I think that's really important. It's not like a 501c3 that's tax exempt, um, like when I used to go to Michael's on behalf of my church and and with my little tax exempt form. That's that's not the case with nonprofit um, 
uh, health plans. So I think that that's important to note. Um, and I am very, very concerned that our small nonprofits, and they seem big to us from Minnesota's point of view, but I'm telling you, um, they're not WellPoint. They're not Aetna. They're not Cigna. And that's what we're asking them to compete with. And so um, if we want to keep our jobs in our state, if we want to keep um, uh, Minnesotans being um, served by Minnesota companies, um, it is a consideration that we need to um, look at and not um, disadvantage um, plans. And I don't have uh, any interest in making it easier for for-profits to come into Minnesota. Be what we saw actually with um, when that law got passed, the next the ne the next group of laws that we saw proposed, which um, didn't become law, were taking away requirements uh, for coverage in the state of Minnesota. You don't have to cover cancer coverage. You don't have to cover, um, you know, maternity coverage. You don't have to cover those things. We're going to take away our, our local state mandates to make it easier and more profitable to come into Minnesota. That's not who we are with health care. And so I just, I, I think that protecting nonprofit health care is, is really important. And, and um, you can disagree with um, other uh, ways that, that companies are, are doing business. And we can, we've got the power. We've got the regulatory authority that we can take care of that um, and, and make sure that businesses are nonprofit health care is operating in a way that serves Minnesotans. Um, but I, I do... Um, want to say I think that we need to look at an eye with protecting Minnesota from an invasion of for-profits. We don't want to um, have the kind of market consolidation and people losing out on health care that we've seen in other states. That's a long concern I have. Thank you, Representative Halverson. <clears throat> Representative Cantrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for this bill, Chair Liebling. Um, as soon as I had heard about this change in law uh, in 2017, I, that was one of the first things that I wanted to collaborate with the folks here to, to change um, for all the reasons enumerated by Chair Halverson. When, uh, when, a, when an HMO has a fiduciary responsibility to treat patients and the lives of Minnesotans as commodities from whom profit is generated, then the true essence of what healthcare should be about health and care is lost. And there's an ample body of evidence and research that shows that folks receive lower quality health care, especially folks who are from less affluent communities, especially folks who are seniors. They receive lower quality health care when they are on for-profit health plans. So I really think that we need to, to go back and change this to, to the way it was because uh, at the end of the day, when we have more and more uh, senior Minnesotans uh, reaching retirement age, uh, next year it's going to be a fifth of our population is going to be over the age of 65 in Minnesota. We can't gamble with their lives. We can't let their lives be used solely to generate profit, Madam Chair and uh, Chairman. So I thank you so much for this bill. I think it's a really important bill. And, uh, and Chair Halverson, I thought that your comments were so on point. So I thank you so much for that. Thank you, Representative Cantrell. Seeing no further questions, uh, any final words? Chair Liebling. Thank you for the good discussion. <coughs> All right, with that, I'll renew Chair Liebling's motion that House File 1378 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Division Bill. Okay. Next, we'll take up House File 551. Okay, and I just need to get grab a current copy. <laughs> Madam Chair and members, I'd like to move that House File 551 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Omnibus Bill. Okay, go ahead. Um, members, this bill is um, about network adequacy. This, this is a bill that talks about what it means to have insurance. So many times we hear from our constituents that although they're covered by public programs, they can't get an appointment. They can't get care. This especially happens with dental care, but it also happens with other kinds of care, mental health care in particular. 
And um, when when an insurance, uh, um, you know, you know, insurance is a really interesting kind of concept. Um, when a person buys insurance or enrolls in insurance, they are essentially getting a promise. They're exchanging their money, or enroll, or somebody's exchanging money for the promise that care will be provided. And in order to make sure that um, that promise has some reality to it, um, insurance products or insurance companies have networks, or they they are um, required to have an adequate network. They're required to have to be to be um, to actually cover care for the people who are um, their enrollees. So um, in Minnesota, the uh, adequacy of networks is regulated by the Department of Health. And members will recall that we had a, an informational hearing some time ago about um, network adequacy and how the Department of Health regulates networks. And um, we learned in that hearing that um, the department is request, gets requests for quite a few uh, waivers. So actually, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here. So there are standards in law for what um, a, an insurance product has to have for networks. So um, this bill does a few things. One is it, it um, addresses what is required for an adequate network. So in Minnesota, we know that we, you know, we do have shortages of providers in certain areas of the state. And um, right now, under Minnesota law, you're required to, um, um, insurance companies are required to provide um, a, a, uh, an, a, have a provider within a certain amount of time or a certain number of miles of where the enrollee is. But there's nothing in law right now that requires that, that that provider ever have an appointment available. And this is the problem. So I've been working in these committees for many years and not realizing that that was the case. That in fact, there is no requirement in law that a person who's enrolled in a product be able to actually get an, an appointment. And if they never get an appointment, as long as the provider is 30 miles or 30 minutes away, that's good enough under the law. Now, I'm not saying that companies don't try to make sure that appointments are available, but in fact, there is no real requirement in law that that is the case. So this uh, bill does a few things. First of all, it started out just trying to change the uh, definition of network adequacy by putting in place some uh, time uh, access standards for appointment wait times. And um, you can see in the bill, and I'm looking here in section eight, um, the access standards, appointment wait times. So we're putting in, in place here in this bill, appointment wait times for primary care services may, must not exceed 45 days from the date of an enrollee's request for routine and preventative care, 24 hours for urgent care. Appointment wait times for specialty care services in accordance with the time frame appropriate for the needs of the enrollee and or generally accepted community standards. And then for dental, optometry, lab, and x-ray services, 60 days for regular appointments, 48 hours for urgent care. So this is, um, as I, I've said in other committees, this is still a bit of a work in progress. Um, I have not had much uh, feedback really on the, um, on the times that are in this bill, and I'm still open to hearing whether those are reasonable. Um, so this bill may change a little bit before the final end, but that was one of the purposes that started this bill. Then, when we learned from the Department of Health that they receive um, many, many requests for waivers each year, and uh, that, um, that, um, we began to think, I think some of us, some on the committee began to think about this process and whether we are um, ensuring through the Department of Health that in fact um, adequate services are available for the Minnesotans who are on our programs. 
and for whom we are paying a capitated rate. So we're paying capitated rates for their care. And then for many people, there may not be a dentist in their area. There may not be a psychiatrist in their area. So there is a process for uh, the plan to apply for an, a waiver. And these waivers are, um, it's, it's unclear to me if they're all given upon request, but it, it certainly seems like many of them are given. So in 2019, there were 4,985 waivers issued. In 2018, there were just a few less, 4,488 waivers issued. So um, what this bill does is it, it changes the, um, it changes some of the, uh, it beefs up the regulatory structure and it charges a fee to apply for a waiver. So, um, this is something that um, we need to do in order to have enough people in the Department of Health that we can actually make sure that these requirements are being met. Um, and another reason for this, members, is that we sit here hour after hour often and we hear about how difficult it is for our constituents to get care and we try to do this and that to provide care. But under our PMAP system, Really, we don't have control over this. This goes back to the fact that we don't know what the rates are. We can't make the, we can't really adjust the rates under the contracts and so on. The only entities that really can do this are the HMOs themselves that have these contracts. And so what this bill attempts to do is put the responsibility on them. It recognizes that waivers may be needed because, in fact, there aren't enough providers around the state to really provide access that might be required. However, if the entity re responsible is the HMO, it's on them to fix that need. So if they have to pay more to a dentist, for example, if they have to encourage a provider to move to an area, these are things that they might be able to do that we as legislators are not able to do with the current structure that we have. So I know the Department of Health is here probably to answer questions. There is an item in the governor's budget that addresses this issue. Um, and um, this bill goes a bit further than what's in the governor's budget. The governor's budget, I don't think, charges fees. Um, and also there's a blank administrative penalty in the bill um, for... Um, you know, if these if these standards are not met. So uh, up till now, there really, I don't think there's been really much in the way of teeth to the network adequacy standards. And if we're going to really be serious about providing care and not just saying to people, you have coverage, then we need to make sure that coverage actually means access to care. And that is what this bill is attempting to do. Thank you, Chair Liebling. I don't see any testifiers on the agenda. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to testify? Seeing none, member discussion, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, uh, Representative Liebling, for, for uh, bringing this bill forward and having the discussion. That was, I, I've learned a lot about healthcare in the last year since becoming uh, a House member. And uh, I was, when I was working on my price transparency bill last year, I learned that insurance providers frequently pay doctors more than their cash price. Uh, and, and I was frustrated to see that because when I went without insurance, I found some things were cheaper uh, than this, the normal office visits with insurance. And when I was having an in-depth discussion with the insurance providers, I found that they pay doctors more than their cash price to get them to come into their network because they have these mandates from the state on creating, you know, providing a adequate coverage in areas. Um, and it was a little frustrating for me to see this discussion earlier in the informative uh, part of this bill or the hearing we had to learn that we have rules out there without penalties. Um, and if Representative Gruenhagen was here, he'd probably be pinching the back of my arm now, but I don't like to see rules, you know, regulations out there if there's not penalties, because then why do we even have them if they're not being enforced? But uh, I'm glad he's not here. Um, the 
<laughs> but at the same point, he might I don't be think watching Representative yeah. Munson. I, I feel like we can't tax our way into having a network that doesn't exist. Like you can't just penalize people for not having a hospital or a clinic that's not there. And um, I don't know if it's addressed in here, but is I, we talked about it earlier in our informative discussion about um, the network having to uh, something about mileage that's there versus we don't have anything about time. So we're out in the country. Five miles in the country is not nearly as far as five miles up here. Um, and I, I would hope that maybe we would address some of the ge geographic limitations. Um, but but one of my frustrations is I live two miles away or three miles away from a hospital that's not in my network, and it's cheaper <coughs> than in my network. And I would hope that we would kind of go towards the, you know, the Right to Shop Act or something where we can allow people to shop outside their network to increase, you know, access to, to care and not just about penalizing insurance plans to pay doctors more than their rates to get them to come into their network. So that's my thoughts and uh, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, Representative Munson, thank you for that. You know, I think that one of the things that I hope you've learned this year from being on this committee is that we have a really crazy dysfunctional system. There are a lot of really crazy dysfunctional things about it, right? And um, people have different ideas about how to fix that. But it's kind of, this is a bill that, um, you know, frankly, going back to what I have said before, and I know you and I have different views <coughs> about this, I think we should have a universal system where we don't need a network because every provider's there and you can go to whichever one you want and it all gets paid for and we do it centrally and we don't have all this crazy wasted time shuffling money from one thing to another and who has and doesn't have and who gets and who doesn't get because we're all people and we all need health care. And we've heard a lot this session um, from, you know, members' bills about people who aren't getting coverage for things that we're all just shocked that they're getting rejected for, right? Because they're sick and they need care. And everybody says, they're sick, they need care. Why aren't they getting care? So all I can really tell you is if you're an insurance company and you're selling that people are going to get care under your program, you've got to provide that care. And um, I mean, in, the insurance uh, carriers could come and speak for themselves about why they have a network instead of just allowing people to go to anyone and paying for it. And I think they would say that this is how they control cost. Mm -hmm. But um, if you're going to sell someone an insurance product, you, you're, gotta be, you're saying to them, we're going to provide you care when you need it. And if, if there's no care to be had, what's the point? So I guess this is it's a bit circular, but this is kind of the crazy system that we have. I hope that kind of addresses what you're saying. Yeah. Representative Munson, follow-up? And, and I did have a specific question on the bill um, on, in section, I guess it's on section 8, um, where we talk about the appointment wait times. Is this uh, requiring an average of 45 days, or is this one time um, where, like in January, when everybody's insurance deductibles reset and they all call their doctor to make an appointment and the appointment times get pushed out beyond that, is it just one complaint that triggers this uh, penalty, or is it... Because that, that happens, especially when around January, when people's insurance times reset, that, that there's a, a longer delay in the January. Or is it an average throughout the year that this would be assessed? Well, um, Madam Chair and Representative Munson, I don't think it's an average. However, I don't think that, um, you know, I mean, I guess we could ask the Department of Health that regulates this now, although they don't now regulate wait times. But um, so I'm not exactly sure how they would do this. I think um, we might get somebody who could address this. Anybody from the department but I, can answer I that? I feel pretty certain that they're not going to be waiting to pounce whenever they, when somebody says, oh, I had to wait 49 hours. And I don't think that's the intention here. Um, but I think that the intention is that, you know, you have to not only make sure there are providers, but that, that there are providers with capacity to take on the enrollees. You know, I mean, insurance companies are in the business of figuring out risk. And so they know, you know, how many people are likely to need this and how many are likely to need that when they decide who to hire and put in their network. So, you know, it, it puts on them the responsibility to say, we need not only to have a pro provider there, but one with actual capacity and willingness to take the patient. Okay. Is, did you want to comment? <clears throat> oh, 
help me out here. I'm tired. I'm not doing that well. <laughs> We're all tired. <laughs> Please state your name. Go ahead. Yeah, Madam Chair and members, my name is Diane Ryderick, and I'm the director of the Health Policy Division at the Minnesota Department of Health. Go ahead. So to the question, um, I would say Representative Liebling is, is correct. So that section of the bill refers to managed care organizations and county-based purchasing um, organizations that contract with the Department of Human Services um, to, to provide care for um, those enrollees. And the contracts that those entities have with DHS include wait time requirements. Um, we at the health department don't enforce those wait time requirements. Um, we do work with the Department of Human Services to do a triennial quality um, review um, to make sure that the MCOs are providing um, appropriate services and meeting their contractual requirements, but we do not um, have direct oversight over wait times um, with those entities right now. Thank you, Ms. Ryder. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the first question I have is about a fiscal note. Um, is there one for this bill? I believe there Burke. is, Representative Schumacher. Mr. Burke? Uh, Madam Chair, members, there is a note that was completed, uh, I think, just in the last several hours. And it has, if you give me just a moment. Madam Chair, it shows uh, general fund costs of uh, 235000 in the first year and 153000 a year after that. And then it creates revenues of 837000 in the first year and 45000 a year after that. So. Okay. Representative Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the only other question I had for this is, I think I might have asked this uh, before too, I don't remember what the answer was, but does this apply to the fee for service as well? Chair Liebling? Um, Representative Schumacher, if you mean fee for service um, under Medi Medicaid fee for service, they don't have networks. So uh, that's my understanding. They don't have networks, so there's no need for it to apply because I think people can go to any provider and I'm looking here to see if, if heads are nodding. Yes, I'm correct on that. Representative Thank Schumacher. You. Representative Loeffler. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative Liebling. I appreciate your work on this and I think it's really critically important in our managed care contracts. Um, we pay so much per month based on people's age and, uh, and geography, other things for their care, for access to coverage. But the easiest way, and I don't think our HMOs do this, but the easiest way to make money on it is to just not be available because that money's going to come in whether you see patients or not, whether you know, you'd, you're know you providing services or not. And this has always been there as a, a check to make sure that for the people who, for whom we're paying that um, premium, sometimes they're matching it with their own private contribution through Minnesota Care, um, that they actually have access to the care that we're buying on their behalf. And... And I think that um, as we deal with the healthcare workforce shortage, um, we have authorized new techniques like telemedicine to meet those issues. I've heard of rural hospitals that have specialists like cardiologists who rotate through. You know, they're there every other Wednesday. Um, there's some really creative approaches that have been shown to be effective in filling the gaps. And this just keeps the pressure up on that, on that creativity. Thank you, Representative. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll uh, renew Chair Liebling's motion that House File 551 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Division Bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Next, I'll have House File 499, Representative Krisha.
Okay, we are taking up House File 499, Representative Kresha. Welcome to the committee. Thank you for your patience. I don't know how long you've been here, but I suspect it might have been a long time. Eight hours and 25 minutes, Madam Chair. Okay, well, <laughs> but who's counting, right? Yeah. But that's fine. So I appreciate the, the hearing. The chair will move that House File 499 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus bill. And I don't think we have any amendments. So, Representative Kresha, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Uh, thank you for hearing 499. Uh, if you're familiar with the work that I've been involved with, this is the Minnesota Training Academy. And I believe this is one of the most important bills that I've worked on in the last three years. This bill appropriates funding for a training academy for social workers who are on the front lines when child protection services are called upon. The appropriation uh, at this point is as follows for the for 2020, it would be 2.8 million, 2021, 3.8, 2022, 4.5, and 2023, 4.5. These are the costs of the general fund and do not account for the federal matching dollar, dollars that are available. I've been working on funding for this program for the last three years and is one of the unfinished parts of the 2015 Governor's Task Force on Child Protection. That group put forth 93 recommendations. Many of, have been implemented and have improved the system. However, the training piece, the most important in my opinion, has been left, is left to accomplish. <coughs> this essential training will result in better outcomes to our child protection system, a system that is 100% reactive and requires assessment of the safety of children. Consider the following statistics. In 2017, 84,000 reports were received and 37,000 were screened for further action. Since 2008, there's been a 75% increase in assess assessments and investigation. Children under eight years old represent 60% of the maltreatment cases. Substance abuse continues to be the largest factor for the increase. 2,681 children in 2013. Thanks, Joe Schumacher. <laughs> I think your words were, we're getting a little punchy, Madam Chair, I heard a bit ago. 2,681 children in 2013, and in 2017, substance abuse attributed to 6,321 alleged victims. Minnesota continues to struggle with the opportunity gaps for the families of color and the American India families. The disproportionality seen in child protection cases is further evidence of a gap in services and opportunities for these families, with the largest areas of consideration being Hennepin and Ramsey County. Looking further into child protection, the out-of-home care is on the rise with 9,413 children in continued care from 2016. This is a 21% increase from the prior year. Prenatal Parental drug abuse continues to be the primary care for new out-of-home care episodes. White children re remain the largest group in out-of-home care. However, disproportionality among minority groups is a significant concern and, by the way, a worldwide program that we have yet to find an answer for. Biological parents are the number one offenders of child maltreatment, followed by unmarried partner or parents. How does this apply to the Training Academy bill? Members, this is the most important step to improving results for our children in these situations. We need to have more social workers and we need, we need to have social workers who understand the cultural and socioeconomic situations. We need social workers with manageable caseloads who can actually spend time assessing these situations and helping mend the dysfunction. Our social workers suffer from high turnover, stress, high pressure environments, and they carry the weight of all these very difficult situations they manage daily. If we can improve the social worker situations, we can improve the training, and we can, we can improve their decision making and the efforts they put forward to help families. Social workers are not the problem. They are the solution, and if we change the environment around them without giving them more respite, 
training and resources, we will amplify the negative results that have caused such great anxiety. Members, this is not an item on your budget. This is an opportunity to get it right. Thank you so much, uh, Representative. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I have with me as a test fire, uh, Dr. Lala Berte, who, uh, do you want to say a couple words or you want to just be available for questions, which is fine too. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, state your name and uh, uh, proceed. My name is Dr. Tracy Laliberti, and I run a research and training center at the University of Minnesota called the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare. And uh, I can really, I know it's the end of a long day, I can answer questions for folks. We've conducted two studies in the last uh, three or four years that uh, provide the support for the bill that Representative Cretia has put forward, looking at um, industry standards across the country, going through and doing a, a fiscal analysis of what their um, training systems have been and, and using that to be able to support um, what's in front of you now, as well as a workforce study that looked at the stability and the impact of what's happening across the workforce in terms of um, the impact of workload and reform in terms of people's willingness and ableness to stay and to be trained. So I'm happy to answer questions. And Thank you, uh, Dr. Lola, but I, we do have another person who was going to testify. <laughs> I see Kuro. We're okay with that. All right, thank you, Representative Krisha. So, with that, any <coughs> questions from um, Representative Lofman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, uh, Representative Krisha, I totally support the need for training. You know that. Um, since the policy uh, uh, hearing, I had shared with uh, Representative Krisha some data on actual child protection caseload by county and um, that I would really want that to inform where these regional uh, offices are located. The bill has on lines 2.15 to 2.18, I think some designations that really don't reflect that. Children are not equally scattered across the geography of Minnesota um, and we want each uh, set of child protection workers to have equal access to support, mentorship, ability to, to have their unique needs. The other thing that is not equally scattered across Minnesota is the diversity of cultures and um, that one has to respond to. Um, and while certain cultures are in both the metro and greater Minnesota, in the metro area we have much more concentration of specific uh, cultural groups that might need particular attention. And so um, I'll continue to work with Representative Krisha before we finalize the bill to to better to make sure that this is balanced so that that child protection workers, uh, whether they're in um, Hennepin County or they're in Kuchichin County, have uh, equal access to a training program that meets their needs. Thank you so much. <coughs> hey, Representative Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say again, thank you, Representative Krisha, for bringing this bill forward. You know, it's been a long time coming, and it's, we're, we're at the point right now where we really have to invest in training our child protection workers across the state of Minnesota on behalf of really the safety of our kids and, um, and all the things that you just stated, and you stated so well. Um, and like Representative Flawful, I look forward to working with you more just to make sure that we are um, uh, working towards this goal of a trained workforce. Uh, because child protection workers themselves are really uh, suffering from from some secondary trauma themselves, and so we got to do better uh, to um, to support them and support our communities across the state. Just want to again say thank you. Any other questions from the members? <coughs> Representative Kunish, yeah. thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative. Uh, Schumacher, I've been waiting for you to ask about the fiscal note. I don't see a fiscal note here, and there isn't any number on there. I've been trying to catch your eye, you know, see who you're going to tweet next, you know. But um, I'm just wondering, is there a, a, a cost associated to this? Have you figured out how much this might cost? How many um, social workers you might include in this training um, program and um, something just kind of along that, th those uh, lines. Yeah, and I'll, I'll grab those numbers here. And I did speak with DHS and I, uh, I, I think maybe I have some help coming. I was told that we have a fiscal note as I've heard today that's just about done. Okay, Mr. Berg. 
Madam Chair, I am not sure about a fiscal note specific to this bill. We had one from last year. Maybe the department is working on one. I was just going to refer to the governor's budget item, which yep. is similar to this, okay. uh, or quite similar to this, I would say. And that costs uh, $4.2 uh, in 2021 and $5.8 uh, in the tails. And if I could turn to my test fire, I, I believe... She has some, she's been working on the numbers, and so I'll, I'll defer to those. Okay. Welcome to the committee. I don't, sorry, I was out. I didn't know if you introduced yourself already. I did, Madam Chair. My name is Dr. Tracy Lalliberti. Um, So I do believe that DHS is a fiscal note. It's slightly different than last year, and it is different than the governor's um, package in a couple of different ways. So I can address what the differences are if people are interested. But generally, um, the numbers that Representative Cresha had read off um, when he introduced the bill um, really addresses the need to uh, robustly kind of redefine the adult learning and training modalities that currently are lacking in, in the training system. Um, it's woefully understaffed. We have 14 uh, trainers at DHS uh, to train all 2,500 workers in the state. Um, that's probably... Uh, 50 less than um, any of the other states that are meeting a uh, industry standard. We have no training whatsoever for supervisors right now in the state, some leadership training, but Minnesota does not require supervisors to have specialized training in child welfare, which was a recommendation out of the governor's task force. So this certainly addresses that. It's a stronger statewide presence right now. All the training is centrally located here in um, the metro area, and this allows us to have some hubs and some outreach areas. Um, as was previously stated, that's not about positioning a, an equal number of staff across the state. It really is about having representation and access for workers across the state in different areas to training and different training modalities. We need to increase the curriculum. We need to certainly enhance uh, what we're doing around cultural reflexivity and training and responsiveness across the workforce. Um, some of the other bills that have been introduced and passed through this committee would potentially increase uh, hiring across the state by upwards of 450 new workers. Um, the current system would implode under that kind of a, a passing. So the infrastructure is really what this um, bill is about, and it's really needed. All right, Representative Kunish Padin. Just uh, well, then to respond to to all of those those things that are so woefully underfunded and under um, under personnel. How did how is it that it's it's gotten like that for so long? Ha, have there been requests that we that haven't been met? Um, is it just something that the whole situation has imploded over a very short time? How is it that we haven't kept up to to that? Ms. Lalliberti. Um Madam Chair, I. I think a number of things have happened. I think if you look 10 years ago, Minnesota was a model across the country in terms of what our child welfare practice was and how we were functioning. At that point in time, we had a different training structure and for a number of reasons that changed within the state system and within DHS and capacity changed. We also then had the reform efforts that came out of the governor's task force and the hiring really just boomed in terms of how many hundreds of literally hundreds of new workers that came in. At the same time, we had tremendous um, stress and turnover and people were leaving as fast as they were coming in. So the training system, which is, is supposed to be responsive and have new worker training done within the first three months of people being hired, some people were hired and couldn't get into training until the ninth month that they were employed. Now DHS has worked through that backlog and people are probably getting in at the three and four month range now, but they're still so understaffed that as some of these other things continue to happen or we get responsive and pass some of those um, things that the governor's task force recommended, which in its study really found a lot of gaps across the practice system, um, there's just no capacity to do it. And just as an example, the governor's task force had 93 recommendations. 10% um, of those directly cited what had to happen in training, but almost 60% of them had implications for training. Because if you're changing the way you're doing policy, if you're changing the way you're doing screening, you have to retrain everybody. Um, they can't keep up. There's just not enough bodies. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Um, other questions from members? <coughs> okay. I have a question, Ms. Lalliberti. I, um, you know, I'm, uh, I was in the policy hearing. You know, I've heard this bill a number of times. I think it's a very compelling case. But, you know, we've heard a lot this session, some bills that a Representative Moran has brought forward. Mm -hmm. We've learned an awful lot about implicit bias in the child protection mm -hmm. system. And we heard some absolutely, I don't even know how to describe it, such impactful testimony, such incredible, you know, testimony about how African American children in particular are removed from their homes at higher rates. And the effect that really the trauma on children of being removed from a home, even a bad home, mm -hmm. right? So, um, it's been really eye-opening for me in particular. And as I look at this bill and understand the need for training, I'm very, very concerned to make sure that the training, you know, if we are able to invest, and this is a fair amount of money, mm -hmm. it's a big undertaking. And if we're able to invest in this, I want to I want to uh, address that issue as well. Because uh, to the degree that we are removing children because... Uh, child protection workers don't understand the families they're they're dealing with and and can't uh, you know understand cross that cultural divide mm -hmm. or don't share you know don't share that culture or whatever or that we're not placing children with family members we're trying to deal with this in different bills but I just could you just talk about that a little bit because it's really you know thanks to re to uh, Chair Moran, this has really risen as a huge unmet need or a huge issue this session. And I, um, I would hate to invest all this money and not be really addressing that problem in a serious way. So could you address that, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think that, uh, and I've been attending the hearings as, as well, and um, really appreciate what Representative Moran has brought forward and, and Senator Hayden. And, and much of that is incorporated. It, you know, it's hard to delineate each and everything within the bill, but the training system as it's currently constructed, um, while it does have some hybrid training, is very much about classroom training. And what we know in terms of people being able to um, look at implicit bias, whether it's institutional bias, individual person bias, um, you need to get at that in a variety of different ways. And if you're really going to change the system and the decision making, you have to change the way that you're training people. And so that is very much a part of this in the sense that, you know, you can't just look at slides and listen to somebody lecture you. You need to have a contextual piece. You need to have an experiential piece. Um, there is a coaching component that is part of this training system that addresses specifically um, cultural uh, and implicit bias and reflexivity, a tool that um, we've considered. We've done some studies to look across the state, and um, actually some folks in um, Duluth are currently using it. It's called the IDI. Uh, and a coaching model is done where people, the workers, do an individual assessment, which can happen in a lot of ways. A lot of people go to cultural or um, training, but then it just kind of dies there. This um, is a process that is an ongoing coaching model to be able to show, uh, have people be able to see where they're at and how they can change over time, where their bias lies, things like that. I think another aspect of that is the supervisor training. We know that supervisors are key to people being um, in the field and being stable in the field, but it's also the quality of their work and how they make decisions. Workers cannot go in the field and just decide to remove kids. They don't make those decisions by themselves. It's supervisors, it's county attorneys, um, it is management and the structure within the counties. And so a, a number of those um, areas are addressed and it's about getting at it in a variety of ways, not just a one-time training. And the last thing that I would add is, um, you know, this gets talked about a lot in child welfare across the country, you know, how do you do this training? It's not either or, it's not a standalone training or embedded training. Um, it's both and. It's embedded across all training. Cultural um, understanding and implicit by it has to be part of every aspect of training. And there needs to be standalone training um, that is experiential and multidimensional. Madam Chair, if I could. And Representative Krisha. Yeah, I want to weigh in on that. And 
agree everything with what Dr. Laliberte said, and also I've been watching the bills that Representative Moran has offered, and and uh, the purpose of what you're trying to get to. Uh, no question, uh, we need to be talking about that. And the the caveat, I don't want to even say a caveat. What I'm going to add to this is what we have done in the child protection system is we tend to push and pull on different areas of it. So we'll push on something that becomes very immediate and it, it will crop other issues up. And the reason I bring this up, the disproportionality among different groups is a huge problem. It's a worldwide problem. I've read studies of Australia trying to solve this, of all 50 states trying to solve this. We just are having a hard time getting at this and I think part of it is we have to understand, and if you've read the 2017 Minnesota maltreatment reports, whether it's the out-of-placement or the maltreatment one, it's very clear in there one of the big things is the, lot, the lack of opportunity gaps of poverty, socioeconomic. We know those are systemic issues. We also know that chronic substance abuse is rising up. And all of these, all these are contributing to really a perfect storm. If you look at the numbers of 84,000 reports in 2017, that means our social workers had to review 84,000 reports and make a decision. Do I screen this family in or do I screen it out? And now remember that social workers arriving on that family's probably worst day of their life. We're all one bad event away from losing our kids. I really believe that. I've seen it way too many times. I don't care who you are, a loss of a family member, a loss of a job. I mean, there are things that just come that can put you in a spot where you are not at a good spot. And now if you don't have the socioeconomic, you don't have the health care, you don't have the wages, you don't have a job, you're turning to substance abuse, suddenly you're in a cycle that you can't get out of. And then a social worker that arrives because they have to respond to this and they're overworked, they, Lord knows how many cases they've seen that day, Lord knows maybe they're walking off of a family that they can't help, that they're trying to get to, and they're going to make a decision. Not only is implicit bias part of it, but a workload, a, a PTSD, a trauma field. You've now put a human to make a decision on another human's life, and they could both be going through the entire worst day of their lives. And how do you screen that in? Or how do you screen it out? And, and then I'll let, so, I mean, I, I just want to say, we have to, we have to look at all of these, and this is why I think this training is so important, is we have to relieve that pressure valve. We have to try to help those people make the decisions about the people they're about to make a decision on. And Representative, or I'm sorry, Dr. Laliberti, if you could weigh in. You're promoting me. I'm sorry, I'd love to. Um, just Lala. the last thing that I'd like to add, I know we use the word social worker whenever we talk about child welfare professionals. The reality is they're not all social workers. And I think it's a really important thing, especially under the reform and the, the things that have happened in the last three or four years. Counties have actually had to relax their hiring criteria. Some counties who used to require a master's of social work degree require a bachelor's degree now. And it isn't necessarily even a social work degree. So while you would expect that people that are coming into this field come in with a certain level of knowledge about how to work cross-culturally and within a variety of communities, you can't keep that assumption. You have people that are starting the training academy who have been postal workers, right. who come from a variety of related fields. And it isn't that folks can't be trained to do that job, but those folks are not all starting at the same place and you have a training system that assumes people are at one place and there is a training curriculum and you move forward. So that's also how we experience some of the issues that we do in terms of disparity and that people are not prepared to work cross-culturally. People are not um, trained and, and ready to do some of this work and so so the training and the need is um, significant. Okay, um, and I don't want to prolong this no. too much. Thank you for that answer. I do have, I do want to <coughs> ask you this because I'm really, I'm still, <clears throat> you know, I, I really want to get at this. So in the bill you have uh, the MinLink study yep. and so there is going to be some uh, reporting on the results of this. Uh, there's nothing in here, though, that tells us that we're going to, what I'm looking for in this is not only to make our system better and help all of our kids that are in these situations in the mm -hmm. state, but I want to see real progress mm -hmm. on the disproportionality in our system. And I'm not seeing anything here that's going to even report to me whether there's progress on the disproportionality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that's... Uh, it's really, really important. I'll just leave it there. Representative Moran wants to make a comment. Yeah. 
in. I won't. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Chair. I won't belabor this neither. But you know, we opened up by stating that Minnesota used to be a leader. There was like we was leading in the country, mm -hmm. in uh, really a strength-based model, and how we work with parents, and how there was the, the support services there, and how, you know, um, yeah, we were just leading. And so, and I might have to do just a follow-up with you both. You know, because change happened mm -hmm. in 20, what, 2014, 2015 through the governor task force. And a lot of what we do and how, what they do, the department, DHS and counties, the way they do their work now is through a risk assessment piece, which is not being addressed, neither, because that is how they are looking at removal through that risk piece. And so my hope is that beyond today, mm -hmm. as I continue to work on these issues around child protection, out of home placement, is to, as I look at the language that I'm carrying in 342 also, is that how do we get to the root of what is the cause of why families are coming into this system too? Mm -hmm. And that's through that lens that, of that risk assessment. Mm -hmm. Any response? Is that a question? All right. So, I did. Yeah, you know, I, I think, do you, did you want <coughs> yes, her to please. respond? Yeah, no, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think you bring up a really great point. The standardized tool, which is a risk assessment tool, um, there is a strengths component to it, but generally speaking, it's a deficit focused tool. Um, and uh, many criticisms of that tool, um, not just in Minnesota, across the country, is that it, it, is, it disadvantages people of color. And so that isn't something that uh, is unfamiliar as a criticism to DHS or to the counties. And I think that that is, while the training system has to train it because it's a required component of Minnesota practice, the training system can't necessarily change that that's the tool that's being used. I think that's another issue to address with DHS. I do think that what, um, what I will say from a data standpoint um, is that workers will document what is in a standardized, um, it's an actuarial tool. So there's a standard set of questions and things that you can mark and that's what get captures in the system. Um, an example of that would be protective factors that you would want to consider that would offset your risk factors when you're making a decision about removal. Well. For some communities, things that would be considered protective factors don't show up in that tool. So workers might know it, they might talk with a supervisor about it, there's nowhere to document it, and then however that decision gets made at the point of removal, it isn't there necessarily. And again, then you're really relying on how well is somebody trained and how are they using that information. So I think you bring up a great point. I don't think the training system can change the tool, they can just change how they train about the tool. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I don't see any other questions. So um, was uh, did you want to say a final word, Representative Krisha? I'd love if you would amend your motion and take the word possible out. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> what are we going to do with that one? All right. Well. With that, House File 499 is laid over for possible inclusion <laughs> in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Thank you, members. Thank Representative you, members. Zerwas, you are on. Thank you for your patience. Uh, which bill do you want to take up first? You want to take up 785? Okay. So, uh, Representative Zerwas will move that House File 785 be laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Representative Zerwas, um, do we need? So, the bill is before us. Please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. House File 785 is a dental uh, licensure bill. Uh, the bill modifies provisions uh, related to licensure allowing for uh, an emeritus uh, licensure uh, to allow uh, physicians or dentists uh, to provide uh, charity dental services uh, after retirement uh, if they choose the active emeritus license, emeritus license and if they choose the inactive emeritus license, then there's no fee, 
no need for continuing ed. They're just listed as inactive um, and having an emeritus license. Some practitioners, after a full um, and, and successful career of, of being a provider and a dental and a dentist, had concerns about that their uh, license would then just kind of end and be revoked. And it, they wanted to be able to retire and show that they ended their career in, in good standing. And those that wanted to do uh, charity dental uh, care wanted a easier, uh, less expensive route to maintain their license. And that's the gist of the bill, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Zerwas. Do you have any testifiers? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the Executive Director of the uh, Board of Dentistry was unable to join us today. She made a wise, wise choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there anyone else in the room who was not so wise? <laughs> who, <laughs> who wants to testify in 785? All right, people are not rushing up to the table, so are there member questions? Representative Munson is, wants to talk to you about the theory of dentistry. Please do. Go ahead, Representative Munson. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Representative Zerwas, I like the bill. Um, I just have a question. Um, I, uh, my father was a chiropractor, retired early um, due to a disability, but did, did uh, you know, wanted to do some charity work, but found that his uh, liability insurance wouldn't cover him if he didn't have, you know, an active license. Does this, if, if somebody has an emeritus license, what does the insurance industry say if they're not doing continuing ed and keeping up on latest practices? Are they, are, are they still required to get insurance or? Does the charity that they're going to be operating under somehow cover their insurance for these providers with uh, an emeritus license? Representative Zerwas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Monson, it's my understanding uh, from the executive director of the Board of Dentistry that there there is actually still um, a limited continuing ed uh, a requirement as a part of the active emeritus license, and then the renewal fee is just half the cost of a regular uh, dental license since they're no longer uh, practicing on a fee for service or, or uh, pay basis. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that the Board of Dentistry uh, examined uh, the potential around um, licensure, or pardon me, uh, insurance uh, coverage, uh, but that hasn't been raised as a concern. Uh, from any of the stakeholders at this point. Yeah, thank you. And I um, probably, if we had, if we had the um, executive director here, we'd know. But I think we have a lot of the organizations that do charity care. I think cover practitioners for that period of time, um, as as part of that. Um, are there other questions or concerns, comments on this bill? All right, seeing none, thank you, Representative Zerwas. House File 785 is laid <coughs> over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill. Last bill, House File 1867. Representative Zerwas, um, is there an amendment? Madam Chair, there's a DE2 amendment that represents um, some compromised language okay. uh, between the uh, Micah and the individuals from the counties and uh, the, the Department of Human Services. Okay, so the DE2 is being handed out. And um, Representative Zerwas, um, let's uh, adopt the DE2 and then you can explain uh, what you're doing in the bill. Um, so um, Representative Zerwas moves the DE2 amendment to get the bill in the order in which he'd like to discuss it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. To your bill is amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and this was heard in HHS policy. It's been around uh, for a few years. As members may know, uh, right now, um, as individuals enter in to our CBHHs or the AMRTC, the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center, um, as long as a patient uh, meets a set of criteria, the cost of that is borne is borne by the Department of Human Services. But as if the Department of Human Services makes the determination that the individual uh, in those facilities 
no longer qualify for that hospital level of care, a switch is flipped, and then 100% of the liability uh, for that cost is shifted back to the counties. Um, over the last several years, there's been incidences and concerns where um, that determination was made 4 p.m. on a Friday, um, on a holiday weekend, mm -hmm. and suddenly Tuesday rolls around. And for these, for these facilities, the per diems that shift uh, to the county, it's $1,390 for AMRTC a day, and it's $1,465 uh, for a, a, a community behavioral health hospital, uh, $1,465 a day. And so we've had incidents where um, at no fault of the counties, there's been challenges with discharge. Um, and under statute, that charge then is shifted to the county. And we have no ability in current statute to even allow for the counties to appeal or get uh, repaid or this charge lifted from them. And so there's multiple incidents uh, where the Department of Human Services says, yeah, that was our bad. That shouldn't have happened. Oops, here's your $12,000 bill. And we have no ability in statute to undo that. Um, so this, this issue has been before uh, the legislature before a similar but not identical uh, language was in the uh, supplemental budget bill uh, that was passed by the House and Senate and ultimately vetoed uh, by the governor. Uh, following that uh, veto and during the interim, there was several months of negotiation where we thought stakeholders were, were really coming together. There was a snafu or a, a hiccup, uh, as it were, uh, this winter. But uh, we do now have stakeholders uh, back together. Um, this amendment that's, uh, that we've now adopted with the DE, this removes the administrative law judge and that formal appeals process. It has the appeals process um, being done wholly in-house um, where the commissioner of human services would sign off on the appeal. Um, I think it was in the last committee uh, hearing in the policy committee when I think um, several members, including uh, Chair Liebling, really expressed the need for folks to come together into a compromise situation. We saw a great cooperation from the department, a great cooperation uh, from the counties as one of the reasons uh, to be able to appeal uh, one of these decisions was removed from the language as introduced, and then the appeal process um, has been brought in-house within DHS and not through the ALJ. Um, that took, to my understanding, from communications with the department, although the fiscal note is not yet finalized to uh, the last of my knowledge, um, the fiscal note that I was ex told to expect by making those two, those two changes dropped the cost of the bill from $9,291,000 to 291000 I saved you $9 million. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Representative Zerwas, it's a good thing we don't have to give you a share. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I think there are folks in the department and from Micah here. Uh, in the interest of time, I told those individuals to be available for questions, um, but that uh, since there appears to be broad agreement, that uh, testimony uh, wasn't needed unless people want to hear from them. Thank you very much, Representative Zerwas. And first of all, I would just ask if anyone in the room does want to testify on House File 1867 as amended. So if anybody disagrees with what <laughs> Representative Zerwas just explained or isn't happy with the deal or anything, now's your time. <laughs> and if not, Representative Zerwas, I really just want to thank you so much for working on this. I, um, you know, oftentimes... Uh, you know, sometimes members, if I can just, you know, since it's our last bill, let me just say this, and we're all exhausted and everything. Sometimes people think that just because you're in the minority means that you can't do anything. And in fact, when you're in the minority, you have time 
That you, all I got. That you don't have. <laughs> right, that you do not have when you're in the majority. And sometimes if you are serious about working to sell, solve problems, which obviously you are, you can get involved in something like this and make real change happen. And I really do appreciate your work on this. It's Thank been, you. really, I think this is um, something that is just, uh, you know, I'm not, we, who knows if this agreement will hold, how this will work out. You know, these, this is, agreements are not forever, right? But to make really good progress on this so that the counties can go forward and DHS can go forward and, you know, see how this works. It may need to be tweaked, who knows? But I just want to, um, you know, give you my appreciation for the work that you did on this. And uh, other comments or questions from members? Seeing none. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Zerwas. I, I, you sparked a, 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 in my mind me remembering that within the language that we adopted, there is a three-year check-in where uh, we're going to, uh, the, the department is going to report back the data on the appeals in the process. And so I think that gives us an opportunity um, as this is implemented to check in on the progress um, and if it's working as the stakeholders expect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Representative Zerwa. So. Um, with that, House File 1867 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS Finance Omnibus Bill as amended. And um, so, members, that concludes our agenda for the day, but I do want to announce that um, we will meet on Monday. Expect a noon meeting on Monday. It should not be long. But um, it appears that um, there might be, uh, I think, House File 5. If I'm not mistaken, is going to come to us just for a very limited purpose, however. So it should not be long, but we do have some business we'll need to finish up on Monday. So you should expect that meeting. We will, we will notice that as soon as we have the details of the room and all of that and the agenda. And thank you all so much for sticking around. It's been a long day, but we, we've covered an awful lot of ground and really appreciate everyone's being cooperative and just having good discussions. And I hope that you'll all actually have a weekend and get some sleep. <laughs> we are jerked. <laughs>